Let's get peppy. Welcome to Pep 132, a surprise pep. Surprise! <laughs> this is Pep, as I've said several times already, or Planet Extra podcast. It's an offshoot of Planet America on the ABC Australia, which you can see on Friday at 8 pm on ABC News Channel. I view on Facebook at ABC Planet America and on YouTube at the ABC In Depth Channel. Or at 9.30 at night, there's a second on Wednesdays. That's a second uh, episode of the show per week. That's on the ABC One, the general ABC TV channel. On PEP, we cover all the stuff that's too nerdy for TV. If you're listening, you can also see this podcast on Facebook and YouTube where you will see special guest Pepper, Bill Wyman. Hey, Bill. Good afternoon, Chaz. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And for those who are new to the podcast who haven't seen Bill before, he's a he's a very frequent guest. He's been an assistant managing editor at NPR Radio Washington. He's written for New York Times, New Yorker, New York Magazine, Washington Post, Rolling Stone, amongst other publications. And given one of the things that you wrote for Vanity Fair, which Dave talked about the other day, oh, which was a- Right. Yeah, this is for New York Magazine. Yeah. Yeah, New yeah. York, yeah, not Vanity Fair. Oh, okay. and, and just to be clear, they have a sort of a website that does culture called Vulture. Oh, so okay. it's New York Magazine Vulture. Gotcha. Yeah, Sorry, so my, my mistake. That's where the V came from. Ah, I see. Yes. Well, that was a ranked list of every Beatles song ever. And given that, I think for today, we can call you Sergeant Pepper. Thank you very much. That <laughs> yeah. is very, and this is a Lonely Hearts Club band. It is the certainly two of us, is. isn't it? Yes, we are. We're very Lonely Hearts. Well, it was very surprising the other day because I was just going through podcasts and cleaning the house and I got to to pep, you know, so I'm just listening and all of a sudden you guys are talking about me. So it's incredibly flattering. I mean, that's the kind of thing that really matters. That, that's the value we bring yeah. on pep, <laughs> at least to you. And particularly the... the <laughs> The substance of the discussion. I mean, there's a mm. lot of criticism of this online. Mm. People just go crazy about it. So I appreciated the informed. Honestly, story. is a brilliant list. Like I, I'm not just I'm not just sucking up here. I literally have spent the last two weeks listening to Beatles again mm -hmm. because of your list. It got right. me. It got, like I mean, every every three or four years, I just get back into it. And you reminded me to get back into it. And I was using your list as as just an example of just some of the songs which I just brush past sometimes. I go, oh, give that another go. And I was just telling you off air that, that I've become obsessed with Hey Bulldog. Oh, that's <laughs> so great. And I barely listened rockin', to it before. That's a rocking tune. It really sometimes is. Sometimes over, yeah. overlooked, yeah. <laughs> yes. But anyway, so thank you very much for that list. Actually, I, normally I would now ask you what you're, if you're grateful for anything. And if you are grateful for anything, you should let me know. But before that, I want to tell you what I'm grateful for because it's related to this which is I am grateful on the Beatles theme for Paul McCartney. And let me tell you why. I loved it. Tell me if, it, I mean, you know more about Paul McCartney than I do probably. So tell me if I'm wrong here. I love the sense of service he seems to have to his fans and to his bandmates and the general gratitude he seems to feel for his life. I love that. And, like, and, and what, what I'm referring to there is the guy doesn't need to be putting out new records when he's 80. He doesn't need to do that. He's very rich and very successful, and he knows that they're not going to be nearly as successful as his previous records, yeah. right? He, he doesn't need to go on tour anymore. Like, like that, he's old. That, that would be exhausting, right? Um, like in terms of singles and radio play, he hasn't been commercially relevant for 20 years. For someone with his success in the past – that probably hurt his ego a little bit, I imagine. But he still pumps them out. Why? Is it because he enjoys music? No doubt he enjoys music, but he can make music without releasing it. The, I think the reason he does it is because his fans want it. I think I think he I see I've seen so many interviews with him where he seems to have such a sense of his fans and what they want. And I love that because and the reason I love that, you might think, oh, well, that's kind of obvious. Why wouldn't anyone be like that? But this guy is a super genius, right? who has been more successful than pretty much anyone else on earth, it doesn't always work out that way. That, 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 like, that if you think about his career, right, the, he's been one of the most admired and wealthy people in the world for 60 years. It, he became like that when he was 25. And I've seen people who lost their way when they were successful for six months. And he's such and, a good point. and he was so much more successful than any of them for sixty years since he was a kid, yeah. and he's remained at least to me seemingly grounded and retained perspective. 
And that is just incredible to me. You know, like I, I also just think about the Beatles for a second. I'm, I'm talk, talking a lot, but you, you, you'll, you'll jump in there. I'm to, um, just think about for where they were at, where the whole world wanted a piece of them 24 hours a day. And in fact, the whole world was relying on them to change the entire music industry, not just once, but over and over and over again, this expectation and this pressure that they were living under while they were kids, while they were in their young 20s, right? Yeah. And, the, uh, and like, you know, like, I don't know if you've ever had, how long you've had adrenaline for at one, at one moment. Like, like sometimes people have adrenaline for a few days. I've had adrenaline at times for, for six months making, making various TV shows. I ended up in hospital. It was too much. Really? Those guys had adrenaline going for seven years. Right, <laughs> and and they almost broke up in 1966 because it became too much for them, and that was even before they became really, really, really successful. It, it only went it only went worse from them. And just think about the intensity of this period for them. Think about the in, like on the outside, everyone was screaming and wanting them. On the inside, they were competing with each other relentlessly. Think about Paul and John. These two super geniuses going up against each other, constantly competing. And he's dealing with John, who's basically a drug casualty. Well, that's that's the thing. And it's just such a tragedy. Like, that's one of the things that I think he would say to you. He'd say, mm. you don't understand, mm. like, 66, 67, 68, mm. I'm dealing with, can you imagine having that close relationship with someone who is basically killing him? Absolutely. absolutely. And, and, and the thing is that it's not a surprise that John became addicted to heroin, given what I just said. The pressure, the intensity, the the relentlessness. Like, of course, people would use drugs as a crutch. Paul McCartney at that at that time was already the bossy guy, right? He so so easily could have his crutch could have become egotism so easily. He's a super genius. He's one of the great yeah. geniuses of our time. He so easily could have become incredibly arrogant and full of himself, and just the and but and I'm not saying he he doesn't rate himself, but just. He's kept grounded in a way right. that so many people do not, you know. And just the, I mean, uh, the, the one example. It's a very nice thing to say, yeah. Oh well, I think it's true. And the, I was going to say with the competition thing, I don't think people fully appreciate how hard that they, those two must have driven each other. You look at say say the single Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields Forever, right? That they, that that was released in what January nine sixty seven. So they were they made that nine sixty six. Three years after with the Beatles, they pushed themselves that far in three years from basically doo wop shit to 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 Penny Lane and yeah. Storyfields Forever Two songs that yeah. you could argue have not been equal yeah since yeah totally like and it's the and so and that and by and incidentally that is when John that's the period where John Lennon became addicted to drugs so that's not a surprise to me yeah. like that the that it became too much anyway so. So, and then, oh, yeah, I was just, sorry, the reason I brought this up was because of Now and Then, right? Which I don't think is the greatest song. It's certainly not the greatest Beatles song, not by a stretch. But what it is, is Paul McCartney clearly doing fan service and trying to pay tribute to George and John in particular, uh -huh. right? And the, and, and the whole thing, the whole thing is done to try to, to give, to create a gift for their, for their fans and a thank you and a goodbye and a resolution to the whole story. And the, and like the, the film clip to me is tacky, like all the, like the John Lennon dancing jigs and stuff, yeah. but the goodbye at the end, oh my God, that's emotional. Yeah. And like, and just the, and yeah, to, to the fact that he's at 80 still doing the fan service, yeah. Like, I just think it's just phenomenal. Well, that's like, really nice. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, go on. So, okay, I would just yeah. say a couple of things. Yeah, yeah, one, yeah. Um, the, what, the only thing that, if, the one good thing about now and then is that it, they're not um, traipsing out to sell a bunch of new product. Mm. And in the past, that's what they did for the anthology thing. Mm. So, that those were really disgusting back then. Mm. Um, the one objection I have to is what they should be saying is, hey, hey we're going to give you this last John Lennon song. Mm. This is a John Lennon single because it was from 10 years after the Beatles broke up. Mm. And they should say, look, it's a Lennon solo single, but we're going to put it together as a tribute to him. So it mm. should say, now and then by John Lennon. You know, with the Beatles sitting, I, that's mm. it's a small thing, but it's just not a Beatles song. I mean, mm. it was written ten years, just like "Free as a Bird" and just yeah. like "Real Love." So, as a critic, that I get grumpy about this that they've mm. done this now for the third time, mm. taking a John Lennon song. Um, one of the funny things that I track is the way um, rock bands are covered. Okay, mm. so I'm because I'm into media criticism and stuff like that. So there was a big profile of the Foo Fighters a couple of years ago, okay, mm -hmm. in the New York Times Magazine, because you get a big profile in the New York Times Magazine when you're up to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And so everyone kind of helps 
you, you know? So they said, they said, you know, and, and Dave Grohl's work ethic is just amazing. I mean, this guy is putting out a record every three years and he's known to play live more than two hours at a time. Wow. I said, Mrs. Springsteen, my smelling salts. <laughs> and, you know, so that's the world we live in. Yeah, okay. The yeah. Beatles put out two albums a year for those seven years, plus singles that weren't like Penny Lane and Strawberry mm. Fields that weren't even on an album. Yeah. All You Need Is Love, not on an album. I mean, people forget there's like 10 classic Beatles songs that were never even released on a regular Beatles album. Yeah. So the work ethic was just extraordinary. And I do totally agree with you because that's the thing I always say about Paul McCartney. And he lost his mom early. We forget that. Mm. That John Lennon, you know, had a great deal of anger. He grew up in a very weird way. He lost his mother very early on in a terribly tragic way. But we forget that Paul did too. You know, his mother died of cancer when he was very, very young. Mother Mary, Mm. right? That's why Mother Mary's coming to him. him. And, um... And he didn't have that anger, and he has been very grounded, and he's just lived this extraordinarily charmed life, and he's been very good about it. Mm. And as I always say about Paul McCartney, you don't have to like Paul McCartney. He still likes you. you know? <laughs> That's just That's the nice. way the world is with him, and you have to yeah. give him that grace. Yeah. Um, and he's really handled himself much better. And you got to admit, Mick Jagger has had a pretty good run. Mm. I mean, they're still making $5, $10 million a yeah. night touring, um, which is more than even Paul McCartney makes, but... Um, um, besides them, I mean, Paul McCartney, I mean, he was the, in the biggest band in the 60s, and he was probably the best-selling artist solo in the 70s. Mm. I mean, who else has done that? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it, I, I completely agree. But I was just going to say that, that, just to wrap up my thoughts at least, is that I think as, as great a genius as he is as a musician, I, th- I find his temperament almost as amazing. Like, given where he's at, and given where he's been, and given, like, just... I just think he's one of a kind. And so I'm very And you know he smokes yeah. a lot of marijuana. <laughs> yeah, probably. I mean, he really does. I mean, yeah. that's not a slur. It's yeah. just, it's yeah. part of his secret. I mean, yeah, they're yeah. very, yeah. Okay. No, I really admire him. There's very, I'm really one of those people who insists on kind of talking about the, the downside because I think a lot of times people don't. Sure. But it's hard to say what Paul McCartney has done wrong, done mm-hmm. bad. He shouldn't have done. Um, and, you know, the things that John Lennon did to him mm. are worthy of a lot of, you know, John Lennon cost the Beatles hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Like right there, just yeah. because of some financial things he screwed up, mm. and he made life very difficult for them. So, and and then and then when John Lennon died, and was treated like a god for, well, for the next twenty years at least. <laughs> like Paul McCartney took that real well, I thought as well. Yeah. Like I, I, he could have been a bit cheesed off by that, yeah. but it's, many would have been. But he wasn't. Well, do you know what cheeses mm. Paul McCartney off? Mm. And, the, and it used mm. to be, I was on the Paul McCartney fan club for decades. Mm. And they used to send out amazing programs and special mm. songs and just crazy, wonderful things. Mm. But um, And then when he first went back to touring in 1989, everyone got this amazing, beautiful program that was the size of like a, a New Yorker magazine. It was mm. huge, just for free. Mm. That's how cool he is. Yeah. But the thing is, and in interviews, and I'll just never forget this, he said, well, you know, the thing is, you know, when when we were in, in Swing in London, you know, John was married. He was living in the suburbs with Cynthia, and I was the one mm. who was doing all the avant-garde stuff. And yeah. he, he's, that's the thing that I just heard him say, because I'm so old now, I've been reading this for 40 years, mm. right? And he always just gets to that thing. He goes, I was, I was doing the avant-garde stuff. Everyone thinks it was John. <laughs> he was living in the suburbs with Cynthia. I was in London. I was living at Jane Asher's house yeah. <laughs> in a very continental way. <laughs> sure, Paul. So anyway, yeah, what a guy. Okay, well, that's a great way to start off. Thank uh, yeah, you. Yeah, and if you want something negative, I'll just say the two, just say two words, bungalow bill, let's move on. <laughs> and, Absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, let's get into the content. First of all, I'll just go a quick update on... Uh, Third party candidates. Uh, I spoke last week about Joe Manchin and I saw something just now, which I'd like to add, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, we talked about whether whether Joe Manchin could be a on the no labels uh, ticket and potentially uh, taking votes away from Biden or Trump, I guess. Um because no labels are already on 12, the ballot for 12 states already and counting. They've got lots of money, so they, they could be on all 50. Um, we don't know, of course, if Joe Manchin is going to join that ticket or not. But if he does, this is what I just read, which was interesting. He might not actually take votes from Biden. And the reason, you know, you think that's a bit strange because he's a Democrat. But according to PRRI, take a guess what his favorability rating is, but according to PRRI. 
Oh, in amongst Democrats? Amongst everyone. Oh, I haven't the faintest idea. Take a guess. Um, Americans we're talking about here. 50%. 12%. Ooh. <laughs> With 41% unfavorable. Lots of people don't know who he is, which makes sense, yeah. right? Here's the key, though. His favorability amongst Democrats, according to PRRI, these are very low numbers, 7%. Yeah. And amongst independents, it was 13%. And amongst Republicans, 18%. So he could potentially take more votes from Trump than from Biden. Yeah. And in fact, or no votes, more likely with those numbers, but uh, they actually did a poll as well to test this out, PRRI. When you added, okay, when you, it was Biden versus Trump was Biden leading 48 to 46, all right? This was not in the last couple of weeks. This was about, I think, six weeks ago. When you added Manchin and Cornell West into the mix, so bear in mind, Cornell West absolutely would take votes from Biden rather than Trump. Right. It went from Biden 48 to 46 to Biden 41, Trump 38, Manchin 10, West 5. So Biden gained a point when you added in Manchin God. and West. Yeah. So it's possible that Manchin could help Biden, potentially. I know. Just, yeah, just all the third there. party things to me, it's, it's, I got to say, it's too complicated for me. It's five dimensional <laughs> chess yeah. because you have the effects of all mm. that. Mm. It's not just that. You have, you know, Jill Stein possibly, yeah. no labels, and who knows what low labels is going to be. You yeah. might have Robert, you know, Robert Kennedy, Kennedy Jr. Yeah. And, um, and then it's the effects of all of those people against each other in the context of the actual election, which is a year from now in each individual state. And of course, it's only going to matter supposedly in the swing states unless it starts to matter in some of the non-swing states. So it really hurts my head even to think about it. So Fair uh, that's what I always think about this is that who knows. But it definitely is true that no labels are not nice people. Mm -hmm. They're going to be funded by anti, but they're going to be funded by pro-Trump people and mm -hmm. Republicans. Mm -hmm. And so there will be really interesting to watch because whatever they do, you know, is going to be designed to hurt Biden. So if they if they decide they're not doing anything, mm. they will have come to that conclusion as well. Yeah, I would warrant. Yeah, but yeah, but I was going to add as well to that that for those who haven't been following American politics for a very long time, uh, the a, a real uh, shall we say warning sign for Democrats when it comes to no labels is the fact that Joe Liebman is prominent. In them, and you might go, well, hang on, Joe Liebman, he was a Democrat. He was a he was a Democrat vice presidential nominee. Yeah, I don't know what happened to him, but <laughs> for the last for the last fifteen years, essentially, Joe Liebman has seemed to just be anywhere where there's trouble for Democrats. He, he's clearly got a grudge against them for whatever reason. I don't know what it is, but the uh, well, I know it is now because the Democrats ended up ended up not supporting him in the primary. and uh, but, but that only happened after he kind of left the Democrats in the first place. So whatever it is, he's involved and he's never a good sign for Democrats. So I think you're right. But I'll just throw out two other things about Joe Manchin. If he, if, he was, other, if he was to run, why he might appeal less to Biden those than you might think. His abortion record is not necessarily great for, for, to appeal to Democrats. And this next election, we know... We don't know much about this next election, but we know it's going to involve abortion. We know that. <laughs> and uh, he says that he supports Roe versus Wade. He criticized Dobbs' mansion, but he also supports a 20-week federal ban. And he's also said that he's very interested in Lindsey Graham's 15-week ban. And he also voted twice against codifying Roe versus Wade in 2022. So he's got the record that they can beat up on as far as abortion goes. And as, as well, he's even though he voted for the Inflation Reduction Act, which subsidizes green energy, uh, he's been a very consistent voice to promote fossil fuels as well, which I think the Democrats will remind their voters of as well. So we'll see how effective he might be as a, as a drain on votes for Democrats if he decides to run. I don't think he actually will run in the end, yeah. but we'll yeah, see. We'll see. So too. We'll see. Um, go ahead, you had another thing. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was just going to say as well, just with him leaving the Senate, one thing which we didn't focus on last time we mentioned, the, the, which the last time we talked about him, is that there's a really important reason why uh, the, the Democrats losing the Senate is a big deal. And as if Trump becomes president, you've been reading a lot recently about various plans that Trump has uh, for, for when he becomes president. I don't know how many of those 
plans are real, how many there aren't. Trump changes his mind every day. We all know that. Um, some of them are a little bit concerning. But if he tries to implement any of those plans, he can't do a thing without the Senate because the Senate is what confirms appointments. But if the Republicans have the Senate, then then they can rubber stamp all his appointments. Yeah. And so and so every single plan that Trump has becomes a much greater threat if the Republicans take the Senate and it seems to me pretty much certain they're going to take the Senate. Unless okay, for them to not take the Senate, they if, with West Virginia gone, which it definitely is gone, it means the Democrats can't lose any of Ohio, Montana, Arizona, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Nevada and Michigan. They can't lose any of them unless they win either Florida or Texas. So they're going to lose the Senate. Anyway, okay, so what were you about to say? Yeah, no, I was going to follow up on abortion for a yeah. second. Oh, oh, oh well, actually, we, we we, we're going to get to that. Later, we're yeah. going to get to that because yeah. we're, we're going we're to go to stuff from last week. Yeah. So, yeah, so we'll get to that. Just save that. I've got one more update, and that's on RFK, which is that uh, he's already caused some rather large issues for himself. It didn't take long. We've spoken on this podcast recently about Bill Ackman, who's the rich guy who's obsessed with people protesting on campuses about about uh, Israel. Uh, he's the guy who, who tried to get the protesters at Harvard named and shamed so that way they wouldn't be hired for any uh, lucrative jobs in the future. Uh, he's written yet another letter chastising Harvard for not cracking down on what he refers to as anti-Semitic rhetoric on campus. RFK replied to that letter on Twitter with, Bravo, Bill Ackman. It's time to hold college administrations responsible for the epidemic of campus anti-Semitism by insisting on zero-tolerance policies. Now, that might be his genuine beliefs and good on him, but that's not a great idea if your entire support base are full of conspiracy theorists because... <laughs> Needless to say, the alienation of unpopular ratbag speech does not go down well with those guys, right? And in particular, crazy, but I reckon the anti-vaxxer fringe out there aren't big fans of people being censored by rich guys peddling conventional wisdom. And so, and, and if you look at the at the replies to his tweet, they are savage, yeah. like from his supporters. Going, oh, yeah, he's such a traitor. I, I thought we could trust you. I thought you were different, et cetera. So he's really <laughs> screwed himself up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so that's a, that, that was just my little update. Now, let's get into, we talked last week uh, and for the last couple of weeks, me and Dave talked about polling and we talked about the election and the wash up. And we covered that pretty thoroughly. But you said that, that you told me off air that you that you were interested in covering a few things about that involving the polling and abortion and those kinds of issues. So why don't yeah, you can start I just off? Just a couple quick just things. Just go okay. for it. So the abortion thing is yeah. so interesting because mm. you know the staple that everyone says. I'm sure you guys have said it too. That it's the the dog that caught the car. Right. Yes. We've seen all the dogs chasing the car. They get the car. Mm. And it is really funny because it's ten times worse than that, as we just saw the other day right? yeah. with the votes. And mm. I mean, not only were the absolute votes about abortion, but even the candidates, it mm. seems to be permeating everything. It's going to be very interesting. Mm. And um, and I believe it's true to I think it wasn't at one state, it didn't quite win, but it's basically won in every state, including a bunch of red states. And apparently there's going, and, and they're thinking that there's going to be on the ballot on a whole bunch of states in all, November. All seven abortion amendments so far have gotten. Yeah. Have I gotten, thought there was yeah. one that there was something that happened, but maybe right. you're right. Yeah. yeah. In in a whole variety of states, yeah. right? So yeah. so this is going to be a devastating thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I just love or that drives me crazy actually is that um it cuz journalism is really hard and of course journalism doesn't have that much effect anymore anyway cuz everyone's mm -hmm. reading TikTok and blah blah blah. But just for the record um you know, people say Roe versus Wade, Roe versus Wade, Roe versus Wade. Well, of course, <laughs> the construct of Roe versus Wade basically is they say, look, first 13 weeks, no restrictions. Yep. Second 13 weeks, there can be some restrictions, but with medical considerations. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after 26 weeks, Bob's your uncle or whatever. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that. But um, <laughs> so, and now we have these ridiculous, pathetic, hypocritical, mindless, goony Republican people saying, well, maybe we should have a 15 week restriction. Mm. Okay. So all these people, okay. And of course, 80, every, you know, you, you don't, you can't hardly ever trust all these figures, but people generally say 80, 85%, 90% of all abortions happen in the first trimester mm. anyway. 
Yes. Okay? Yeah. And the whole reason they want to cut it off at three or five weeks or something like that is to stop all abortions, mm-hmm. right? So now you literally have leading presidential people like Nikki Haley and all these babies, oh, 15 weeks, you know, mm-hmm. which is basically a complete surrender to the Roe Ro versus Wade standard. Mm-hmm. And if they were to enact something like this, it would still be a hardship on a on a, on a relatively small and but very vulnerable percentage of women, and that would be wrong. But it's just incredible to me that of all the, the um, I don't want to say corrupt, but just like the vacuously hypocritical and things that the GOP and the Republican Party has done over the past 10, 15 years, this is really way up there. And it almost ranks with the insurrection because abortion has been this insane, it's like the Second Amendment stuff. It's just people are absolutely insane. They're so senseless about it in the first place. And now is this absolutely senseless position, which I'll get to in one second, and now it's even more senseless. Mm. And just for the record, the reason it was so senseless originally is that as the Clintons always said, abortion should be safe, legal, and rare, mm. right? Everyone agrees to that, right? Mm. The simple way to do that, have sex education, mm. make sure- Contraception. Th- and make sure con- they mm. know how to use contraception that's available, right? Mm. Oh, no, we can't do that. Why? Mm. Oh, my God. Mm. You go, well, why? Oh, my God, that's the worst thing. What, like, what's worse? making sure kids know how to use conception or killing babies in the womb, which mm. I understand you guys are really upset. Oh, no, 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 we can't have sex education. So mm. that's why the whole abortion position is so senseless in the first place. Mm. And it's all, and the reason is basically, a lot of people just don't think about it. They're just reflexive. But again, I lived in Arizona. I know a lot of these people. And the thing is, is they're anti-sex. Mm. And they want kids to be punished for having sex. Okay, like if you have sex, you're going to have a baby. You have to take care of the baby. That's just what they want. And they're just crazy about it. They don't really want to take any action to reduce the number of abortions. And in fact, the Democrats have done a great job in reducing the number of abortions over the years, except for, ironically, in red states, because they're full of backward people who don't teach their kids about contraception. And um, and so anyway, it's just amazing to me that they've actually topped themselves by doing this political and intellectual moral backflip that was worse than what they did before. I'll tell you what's what's weird about that though, and that is that with the anti-sex thing, and I, I, I'm not disputing that characterization at all. What's weird about that is I'm not suggesting these are the same people. They're like, yeah, the world is complex, <laughs> but there are at least another group of people who are conservative who are becoming, who are family values types, who are becoming increasingly concerned about the fact that kids are not having sex anymore. You might not not, not be aware of this, but if you look oh. at if you look at the polls, kids are not like when I say kids, I mean I mean pre adults, right? Like the less than eighteen are not having sex. I don't have the numbers in front of me because I didn't expect you to be talking about this. Yeah. But the uh, it's dropped off a lot. And and people are blaming video games and, and, and being online all the time and not going out, not socializing, kids kids talking to each other through text rather than person to person contact, kids kids having a being cosseted and having this being wrapped up in cotton wool and like the, 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 no one really knows why. These are things that people speculate, yeah. but it's just a fact that that people are putting off a lot of things they used to do much, much later. Like they're driving less. They're getting their, li- their license later. Wow. <laughs> I'm 47 and I haven't got <laughs> my license yet. <laughs> I'm a terrible example. Um, but no, but they're, they're, a lot of the markers, they're moving out later. A lot of the markers of what used to be seen as adulthood are being pushed off later and later. And one of them is sex. Wow. And there are people who are concerned, increasingly concerned, that that is part of the reason why the birth rate is dropping as well. Like the uh, that it's it's it, that that there's a series of dominoes. One leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, and people end up having less kids. And the and uh, now I don't know if that's if that's directly related or not. I'm just passing on what people say. But just it, it it would be funny if we went directly from people being concerned about too much sex to being concerned about not enough sex. More sex. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Which is interesting. Well, was, they want yeah. kids to have babies. That's the thing. They mm. want them to marry. They want them to be married, though. Mm. They want. They think you should get married, have sex, have mm. a baby, have sex, have preferably have one to one correspondence to mm. the having the sex and the baby. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have, have sex twice in your life. <laughs> no. Yeah. Come 
on six, seven. Yeah, <laughs> sure, no, yeah, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, yeah, yeah. so yeah. yeah. So anyway, I'm just I'm I'm. It's just something I really came into a lot because I spent most of my career, mm. you know, in in these liberal enclaves, mm. and it was really good for me to go back to Arizona as an adult and start dealing with having normal conversation with people, and it's just bizarre. I do agree with you, by the way, that it is quite. I, I wouldn't necessarily use the word hypocritical, but cynical for people who until quite recently were pushing hard the every abortion is a murder thing to then turn around and go, hey, but 15-week ban, no problems. Oh, right, because like, they're, well, like, they're really scared. Yeah, yeah. When, when oh, no, they're when, really when, scared. When it's, when it's politically convenient. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, oh, yeah. yeah. It's really amazing. Yeah, but um, I mean, look, obviously I welcome, if if yeah, if yeah, in the worst case scenario they got their way and there was a 15-week ban rather than a complete ban, I would I would prefer that <laughs> from a political point of view, but it is, it is a very cynical Yeah, no, I mean, move. honestly, and particularly yeah. if it was national mm. and it applied to the deep red states, mm. I mean, you'd take care of 85% of the poor girls yeah. and women there who are going to be victimized. I mean, that's except, the tragedy. Except, about- that, except they'll never accept that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but yes. Oh yeah. No, that's yeah. the other because yeah. it is cynical. Really, yeah. it's just what you say. They just yeah. they're just trying to skate through it and see Nikki Haley do it was mm. particularly delicious. I thought. <laughs> Can I um something else you picked up, which I actually just happen to have a stat nugget lying around, which I wasn't going to use, but I'll use it now that you mentioned it. Just in passing, you said about how people aren't following the news anymore. I have a stat nugget about that. It's okay, a it, it's a, it's, a, it's, well, it's it's more a poll. People don't like when I do stats nuggets as polls, but still, it's from Pew. Stats nugget, stats nugget, stats nugget. Yeah. The share of, of Americans who say they follow the news most or all of the time has dropped from, in 2018, it was 52%. Now it's 38%. It's dropped 14%, which is a third, well, a little bit, more, a little bit, a little bit less than a third of what it was. Uh, just in the last five years. But Chaz, if that were true, you could have something like a complete anti-democratic, corrupt, c- crypto-fascist <laughs> candidate come to power and be considered as a national presidential candidate. Now who's cynical? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that, I, I, your sarcasm is noted. Uh, but, uh, and in particular, on that note, it's amongst Republicans. The, the Democrats... Uh, their news following has dropped from 49% to 42%. Republicans has dropped from 52% to 37%. And it's very complicated yeah. because there's so many weird nuances um, mm. that happens in this because the thing that drives people like me crazy is they say, oh, I read it on Facebook. Oh, it was on TikTok. Mm. Oh, it was on Twitter. And you go, well, what was it? Oh, it was this thing. And you go, but was it an article from the New York Times or yeah. was it something from Newsmax or was it your Uncle Rob? <laughs> oh, well, they said... And they, they just don't, besides that, when they do get the information, there's not that that thing that I assume people like you and I have. We mm. go, oh, what, what's the source of this? Yeah, let's check it. And mm. um, and then a lot of times, of course, you have all the clickbaity stuff. So sometimes the source is relatively reputable, mm. but it's like a clickbaity thing that was on Rolling Stone or Vanity Fair or whatever the things that they follow, the Daily Telegraph or news.com.au or mm. the Daily Mail, right? Mm. They all... All those places, they think they have their own standards, which mm. they do or they don't. But they're when you really look at what they publish, they publish all the stuff and they, oh, we're just going to throw all that other crap up there because we know mm. it's going to mention Lady Di, Dear Lady Die or Beyonce or whoever the um, the clickbaity thing at the moment, and people get mm. their news from that. So, what, do you have any theories about why people might be paying less attention now? Do you think they just had enough, or do you think? Well, I, it's weird because people, you know, all these news sites, like I don't know the stats or anything like this, but most daily news sites, I'm sure the Sydney Morning Herald would say, oh my God, we have 15% more engagement on our site mm-hmm. than we did 18 months ago or two years mm-hmm. ago. I mean, you know, these places, if they're not growing, everything mm-hmm. I've ever heard from them is, oh my God, our online thing is mm-hmm. is doing great. And the only mm-hmm. problem is monetizing it, right? Mm-hmm. You got to get people to subscribe and blah, blah, blah. So um, my understanding is that reading of newspaper things quote unquote traditional news mm. is has you know increasingly been going up and up and up i mean at least in terms of page views yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah, like that yeah. so i'm sure a lot of people are getting that mm. but of course you have so many other people who are checking out um and a lot of these you know kids like you can we can all complain about what they whether it's occupy war wall street or allegedly being anti-semitic or allegedly being anti-palestinian they are getting their quote unquote news from somewhere yeah mm. and um and you can make the argument that um, I, of course, deplore any anti-Semitism, and, and I'll mention something in a second that really appalls me, mm. um, but 
and I don't want to get into a big thing about this, but there is a difference between being virulently anti-Israeli, Israel, mm. which is a totally legitimate thing to be, mm. even if you don't agree with it, mm. and being quote unquote anti-Semitic, yeah, which is like, oh, I don't is. like Jews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which of course, and and you know, this is traditionally in America, mm. like that line is mm. very conveniently blurred. Mm. Okay. And so I think there's a lot of people who are very engaged, and I'm not defending this. I'm just mm. saying their position would be look, at, we've been criticizing Israel for a long time. We knew something like this was going to happen. Mm. Yes, the Hamas thing was disgusting and despicable. Mm. However, you know, we can hold Netanyahu responsible yeah, for this. Totally. And sometimes they do that in a very disrespectful way. Mm. And so, for example, I teach the university and I got off my little bus at the Footbridge, right over mm. here, Footbridge Theater, which I'm sure you know well. Yep. And I have pictures of it. There's a pile on the ground of those red posters of the Israeli hostages, mm. you know, that are up all over yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah, the kidnapped ones, yeah. And they were all ripped up and torn mm. up and thrown in a soggy pile right by the bus stop. I have mm. pictures of it. I mean, mm. and... I don't think that's necessarily anti-Semitic. Mm. I really honestly don't. I think it's incredibly disrespectful. Mm. Um, and I think that people are being, um, they're being deliberately disrespectful to Israel, which they have a right to be, okay? Mm. And I'm, I totally don't agree with that, doing that, of course. But, um, but you could make the argument that people are engaged. They do, they do mm. know something about this thing and they have strong feelings, mm. right? Yeah, although I, if anyone's going to be engaged in politics, you'd think it'd be uni students. So, yeah, like, Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, on that note, I wasn't going to bring this up at all, but just on that note, something which I've just been thinking over and over again, because I, I read a lot of, of conservative news, obviously. I read a lot of news full stop right across the spectrum. But in the, con the conservative newspapers I read, or news sites I read, are obsessed with people tearing down those, those oh, kidnap yeah. posters, right? And like I've, I must have seen... I must have seen... 50 videos of of people tearing down their videos because they, 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 these sites just keep on showing these videos because they're obsessed with it, right? And they they see that as the as I'm not, this is right this is what you're talking about. They see this as the the ultimate sign of anti semitism, essentially, right? That they're tearing down these posters and they go, look at that, look at these people tearing down these posters. And the thing I I now I mean I've made my my thoughts clear on on this issue. Like I'm I. I'm very sympathetic to to um, uh, to uh, the, the the victims of the Hamas of Hamas, and I'm not I'm no fan of Hamas. I always distinguish between Hamas and the Palestinians, of course. But the um, uh, yeah, I I definitely like I have no, nothing but sympathy for these hostage victims. But there's something which needs to be said about this, which is those posters are propaganda. Like those those people have not been kidnapped in Australia. Right when you see a kidnap poster in Australia of someone who is who is in 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 uh, in, in in Gaza, that's not a legitimate kidnapped poster, right? It's not saying, oh, if you see this person, <laughs> ring their parents. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, that's what that's what kidnap poster is meant to be. It's meant to be a like a crime poster saying, please help us as a member of the community to find this person, right? But it's not. It is. Propaganda. It's just saying it's it's just pushing the Israeli cause. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, and, and, and I can see how someone would go. You know, fuck off with your propaganda. Yeah. Even if they're not virulently anti-Semitic, whatever, they just go. Yeah. They just go. You know, I, I don't need this in my face right now. Like these. The, like that's not a real kidnap poster. Yeah. I could now. I'm not going to be tearing them down. I'm not sympathetic to the people who tear them down. But I'm saying that. There is a, I think, a reasonable point of view where someone could think it. Now, the videos I see are, are not those people. The videos I see, there's guys with kefirs who are, yeah, you know, who are going about free Palestine stuff. Like it's very obviously political. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, argue in bad faith here. Yeah. I'm just saying, let's not forget that those posters are propaganda. Right. Right. Every single one of them in America, in France, every single video is, unless that that poster is in Israel, it's propaganda. Yeah. <laughs> and they have a right to put them up there. Yeah, sure, totally. And I deplore, though, you should you should greet speech you don't agree mm. with with more mm. speech. You mm. shouldn't take actions to mm. limit the purge debates. It's despicable mm. and wrong mm. to take it down. And I'll go one more step. Mm. I think that what Israel should worry about more than anti-Semitism is the disrespect toward Israel. Because at least in America, you know, the, the whole idea of anti-Semitism in America, I've been on the left in America my entire life. Okay, Remember, I went to UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I worked in the alternative press. I worked for Salon, which is the epitome of the liberal thing. I worked at National Public Radio, blah, blah, blah. I have never seen an example of anti-Semitism on the part of the left, okay, ever. Mm -hmm. Now, I also lived in Arizona. I grew up in Arizona. I grew up among anti-Semites, okay? Mm -hmm. I know very well mm -hmm. what it is. Now, 
And are sometimes people on the left disrespected toward Israel? Yes. But I mean, I think I would have seen it if it was endemic on the left. America is overwhelmingly pro-Israeli. Obviously, the elected officials are. Israel doesn't have to wear, you know. And now, there are people on the right, of course, who are very anti-Semitic, and those people should be shut down, et cetera, et cetera. But all I'm saying is Israel should worry more about people being disrespectful toward Israel and losing their affection and support of Israel rather than anti-Semitism. Uh, that, that, that's, that, that, that's fair enough. And I think, I think the, point, the point you're making is a well-made point. But all I would say is that I am definitely seeing anti-Semitism. <laughs> like, 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 oh, no, me too. There yeah, is yeah. out there. Like, like, like on the left as well. I am definitely seeing it. Like I, I, I'm shocked at how much anti-Semitism I've seen in the last no, six weeks. No, and I weeks. have too. I mean, there yeah. definitely has like, been instances of it. Like, yeah, and, and, and not just that. The, I know a number of Jewish people who are scared. We're actually going to get, get to something like that, something related to this later on. I, who are, like who, I know people who go to, a, go to Jewish schools who they're covering their logo of their school uniform with their jumpers when they leave. In Australia. Because they, in Australia, yeah. because they get harassed. Yeah, that would be And very their crazy. parents, I know their parents, their parents are scared. Yeah. Their parents are not ridiculous. Their parents are not stupid. They're, they, are, they are reasonably scared from the hatred that they are experiencing. And they're not Israeli, they're yeah, and that's Jewish. Disgusting. Yeah. yeah, and so that's, that's it. that, that is real. Like, like I think you need to believe people when they say, I am feeling hate from people. And like, especially, where, especially if these people are reasonable people. And I, I know people like that. Yeah. And like, and they're just they're leaving that aside, you see plenty of evidence online. So there is a lot of anti-Semitism out there, but I, the point you make of that, that there's a whole different ball game as well about, about retaining the affection of America because obviously America guarantees the existence of Israel, essentially. Right. That's a very important point of view. Um, and Israel has yeah. abused that over the last 10 oh, years. Yeah, the Trump has big time. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Okay, um, okay yeah. Uh, the, the, so we will get back to that. But I just wanted to just, before we leave elections from last week, yep. I don't know if you have anything else to say about the election last week or polling or anything like that because you said you had a few things to say. Um, yeah, um, the um the one thing can I just mention one thing? Yeah, more you can mention as many things as you want. About, man. <laughs> um, uh, I lost my little thing here. Okay, that, okay. Well, um, while you oh, find it, it. Oh, oh, okay, right, I got so, it. Okay. Just that these are the states that are probably going to have abortion things on the ballot in November. Yes. Okay. Tell Did us. you gone over this? Uh, I've I've mentioned Florida before. I, I apparently I, this yeah. is Axios. These are this yeah. saying where it's expected. Yeah, okay, sure, so yeah. Arizona. Yeah. Two interesting things here: Arizona, Colorado, Florida, yeah. Iowa, Maryland, Nebraska, Nevada, wow, and New York. Okay, so three, well, Colorado is sort of a swing state. So, yeah. um, but the- Arizona is important. Right. Yeah. So we're just, it's just that the swings that we're seeing, and if, if the abortion, if the Democrats can maintain abortion, the opposition as an issue going into all those states, that's a big deal. And given that Biden was down 11 points in Nevada in that New York Times poll last I week, that's, I think, that's, that's I think they'd Nevada. like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and then the other thing Axios has, you can look it up if you want, is it has a map of all the, um, the, so, the um, uh, toss up in one way or another congressional districts okay and i think there were 24 of them total in those seven or eight states and three or four were pretty lean red mm -hmm. and the rest were either toss up or lean democratic mm -hmm. and so you can kind of you know to the extent that any of those candidates can tie themselves to that decision or they're running against someone who can't can be tied mm -hmm. to the dops decision um that would be good in terms of um and one interesting thing I want to stress because I write in the City Morning Herald about this stuff is that when I say good for the Democrats or yay, I don't. I'm not pro Democrat. Mm. <laughs> as as I meant to quote this before, but you know the guys who did South Park, you know the the Trey Parker and yeah, you know, yeah, South yeah, yeah. Park, right? So they gave a big speech at Neil and not Neil, um, uh, one of these famous Hollywood do good liberal guys, Norman Lear's big. Promise for America group, right? And they yeah. were the speakers. And they said, um, you know, we just want to say how disgusting we find conservatives in America, you know, the things they have done. They all, everyone cheered and they said, but we really fucking hate liberals. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. And, and those guys are crazy. And that's kind of how I always feel. Yeah. <laughs> okay? yeah, yeah. I really disagree with conservatives in America, but I really fucking hate liberals. <laughs> and so I just want to make stress I am not partisan in these things. However, yeah. in this thing that what the Republican Party has done to itself. I mean, long ago, it's become this ridiculous and despicable um, kind, you know, group that's really causing a lot of hurt and pain in America. Mm -hmm. And so, so when I talk, oh, this is good, I'm just saying it's good to defeat the Republicans who really need to get spanked, okay? And we sure. really thought they were going to be the last couple of times mm -hmm. and they haven't yet. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and can I just mention one thing about polling? 
Yes, you can. Before you do, before we move off the election, just to say that thought for a second, I want to just mention um, about and on, on the abortion before we move Ooh, off. Oh, yeah. Uh, there, there's one other thing that happens with abortion laws, which would from cynical people that I think makes makes their situation significantly worse. Like what I'm referring to there is in Ohio. They just passed a constitutional amendment to guarantee the right to an abortion when you have when you have a non viable fetus, and the like. It, it and even when viable, uh, a, allowances need to be made for the health of the mother um, the, before you can restrict um, abortions. Okay, four Ohio Republican state lawmakers came out this week saying that they're hoping to remove the state judiciary from having the jurisdiction to interpret abortion rights. <laughs> and then they will legislate abortion in a way that they feel is appropriate. And, uh, and the courts can't judge whether it, whether it, can contradict, it was contradicted by the constitution or not. Now, you might, now, for those who are watching this go, they can't do that. Oh, yeah, they can do that. that, that is, it's called jurisdiction stripping. It happens, I wouldn't say it happens all the time, but it's happened before. And it's something that people talk about sometimes doing with the Supreme Court, the Congress doing to the Supreme Court. So, yes, they can do that. It would be an outrage, but they, but they can potentially do that. I, I have faith in Mike DeWine who, that he wouldn't sign off on that, but maybe he would... Maybe he'll disappoint me. <laughs> but um, he's the governor of Ohio. See, and can I just say something what's so yeah. funny about that, yeah. right? Yeah. Is that these guys, mm. they literally just lost two votes in this, yeah. right? Yeah. There was one six months ago yeah. where they tried, you know, we yeah. won't have to go into that. But there literally were two votes on this in Ohio yeah. in the last six months. And in both times, it lost by 58%. Yes. Okay. So I think what you have is you have a couple of you in very safe red districts who are trying to do whatever, but it's just going to cause a world of hurt to the Republican Party. Well, this is in the Ohio. thing. Yeah. It's the thing. It's not going to help them, right? Because I, I should just just what they say is the reason they're doing it. They don't, they don't say we're doing because we're evil. They say they say we need to prevent mischief by pro-abortion courts with issue one. That's what's called the amendment. Ohio legislators will consider removing jurisdiction from the judiciary over this ambiguous ballot initiative. <laughs> the Ohio legislature alone will consider what, if any, modifications to make to existing laws based on public hearings and input from legal experts on all sides. <laughs> right? So I just want to draw attention to a couple of things there. First of all, the ambiguous ballot initiative, the language of the ballot initiative was their language because the Ohio Republicans changed the language to make it less less amenable to voting. Like they 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 use uh, uh, not radical, but they use they use inflammatory language on it. That was you know the the pro life language, the spin on it to try and get people to not vote for it from the language. They still vote for it anyway, and now these people are looking at their own language and saying, "Oh, that's very ambiguous." Right now, so that that number is so cynical. Number two, if ever there was a a campaign where people knew what they were voting for, it was this. So much advertising was bought on the Ohio airwaves. Everyone knew what they were voting for, right? Regardless of the language, right? Um, uh, and there was another letter signed by twenty seven state reps from the Ohio House Pro Life Caucus that said, "We will do everything in our power to prevent our laws from being removed based on perception of intent." We were elected to protect the most vulnerable in this state and we will continue that work. Now, when they say perception of intent, there's no question of intent here. <laughs> like, there's, no, there's no perception issues here. 57% of people were very clear about what they thought. Once again, it was very well promoted. There's no issues of ambiguity right. or yeah. perception. And when they say we were elected, you hit on the, the key before. They weren't elected. Ohio is one of the most gerrymandered states in America. And like, almost none of these people were elected. Like they, every single one of them was handed a seat that they couldn't possibly lose. Yeah. They've never faced a real election in their lives. So they, they are completely immune to democracy. And now they, they're talking about using, like they're trying to thwart a democratically elected constitutional amendment by using the language of democracy. It is just outrageous. And, and what, but what happens? I don't think that's going to happen, right? I think they're just, I think they're just blowing yes, off steam, yeah. right? But if they did that, it would have such a backlash. Number one, they would 
just guarantee that that the Senate race would be a Democrat, the governor would be a Democrat. It would just like it would it would just even though those people re- would retain their seats because they're so heavily gerrymandered, like it would just they would reap the whirlwind in such a big way. Like you you can't keep repressing democracy over and over and over again and have and have it not bite you hard at some point in time. It's very interesting because, you know, in 1980, I'm old enough to remember 1980 when Reagan was elected and, Mm. and, you know, it just displaced, I forget how many Democratic Senate seats, but just, it was just crazy that night. I mean, eight Mm. or nine or 10 famous Democrat Senate, Democratic senators were knocked out of office. Mm. And it's really hard to think since then where you've seen something quite as virulent as this abortion issue. I mean, and Republicans kicked Democrats' ass. Mm. Remember, Dukakis got his butt kicked. Mm. Uh, Mondale got his butt kicked. Obama, yeah. 2010? What? Uh, like the, the, the midterms, the 2010. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's just, yeah. I mean, you know, there's just been like big things that have been happening. Yeah, and yeah. and the Democrats squeak mm. into office every once in a while. Mm. But um, the this abortion thing is really, really interesting. I mean, when mm. you really look at the, um, the numbers of the people voting versus the way the state generally votes, I mean, it's literally in the double digits in mm. almost every single case, sometimes a lot more. And um, if you, again, all these third party candidates may screw everything up, but a race in, 19, in 20 the race in 2020 was decided by a very, very small margin. Yeah. And so any, to the extent that this even helps Democratic candidates for one, two, three percent, combined with all the insanity that would accompany an actual Trump candidacy in the general, um, it's pretty interesting. And can I go into, and that's why, uh, that's the one thing I was just going to say about the polls, right? Yeah, go for it, yeah. Because as everyone knows, in the last couple of weeks, there's been the series of polls, not general polls, but specific swing state polls that had a lot of alarming results for Democrats, right? Mm, yeah. And I think in Nevada, Biden was behind by 11%, 11, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then, um, it wasn't doing well in any of them, except I think it was Michigan, right? Yeah. Or was uh, Wisconsin. One, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the thing is, it's, I totally believe in polls. I'm not mm. one of those people... The people who run these polls are very mm-hmm. smart people. But I still, I was on the ABC about three or four months ago and there was some poll and I just said, I want to call it poppycock, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I really honestly think these polls are poppycock for mm-hmm. a whole bunch of reasons. And one is that it's obvious that Trump has this floor slash ceiling, mm-hmm. right? That doesn't change much. Mm-hmm. And so it's not like Trump is going to be pulling more people into his camp. I mean, mm-hmm. he got the percentage of the vote he got along, he got three and a half years ago or three years ago now. And... um and this year, he's going to be involved in three or four trials. He could have been found guilty in a couple of them. He can conceivably have been sentenced by this time. And, you know, the idea that he's going to get more um, is going to be dependent on only one thing, which is that he holds every single one of the votes he already had and finds new votes, that he's going to go to that well again and bring out people who hadn't been there before. And that's fine. He might do that. He's done an extraordinary job on that, right? He won an election seven years ago, and he almost got reelected. So I'm not, um, but there's that. But then there's the, um, obviously the Dobbs decision. There's all this hostility on the right to trans issues and gay issues still, which Mm. is a very polarizing thing. I think the Democrats have done a really crappy job on this. Mm. This is a big issue for me and why everything, I don't understand why Biden isn't saying, how can you support um, Vladimir Putin? Do you know what he does to gay people? They persecute gay people in, mm. in Russia. Do you know what they do? They murder them. They castrate them. They mm. cast them out in the streets. They mm. let them. I mean, why doesn't he say that? Every, every person under 30 or 40 in America right now, you hear Vladimir Putin castrating gay people in mm. Russia. Mm. I don't understand why they don't make that um, more of a deal. It's very polarizing. Republicans are finally losing on all these cultural issues. And I think there's going to be a lot of that in the next election. Um, we got to remember that Hispanic vote grows every year in a lot of these swing states, Georgia and Arizona particularly. Yep. People keep talking about how this is basically all I wanted to say is I just want to say, here's some considerations yeah, to remember yeah, yeah, in terms yeah, yeah. of this polls. That um, like things like the Hispanic vote are very interesting because they, you know, there's all these studies of the Hispanics. Oh, more and more Hispanics are voting Republican Especially than they used to and things like yeah. that. Yeah. And it's very interesting. I'm not a huge demographic expert, but there is this interesting thing that happens with immigrants, right? You have these immigrants who come to a country. They have kids. They work hard. They do their best. The kids grow up. They're a little bit. Oh, hey, what do my parents do? Mm-hmm. But a lot of them are kind of, hey, I re- understand I was brought up right. My yeah. parents taught me all these things. Mm-hmm. Then you get to the third generation <laughs> and you get these fuckwit grandkids and all this stuff. <laughs> and then and meanwhile, That's that me. original or that <laughs> yes. original um 
generation is getting older and older and yeah. just becoming more conservative or getting set in their ways. And then that middle generation is mm-hmm. going through teen years, 20s, mm-hmm. 30s, having kids and stuff like that. So you have this natural assimilation in which these immigrant groups become less, quote unquote, that immigrant group and just start blending into America. Yeah. That just happens always. And Hispanics, and I forget, I was digging this up somewhere, but there was a big study about them in Arizona, um, where obviously the Hispanic there's a big Hispanic, forty mm. percent Hispanic population, and um, so. But we have to remember, it doesn't matter what the dividing line is. It's just that the more Hispanics that vote every year, two, three percent more, they're going to break in some way positive for Democrats, right? Mm. Um, not to mention young people who are increasingly disaffected with the Republican Party. And then you have that natural democratic thing of, oh, we hate the president. Oh my God, he's too old, which he is. <laughs> yes, he is. Okay, um, yeah. but. Um, I also think a lot of people, they understand. I mean, the Democrats have been so disciplined. You know, there's been hardly any AOC problems, mm. you know, in the last six, or seven years. Biden did a great job. Pelosi did a great job keeping everyone unified. Mm. And so I think it's one of those things that it's just hard to see. There's no Democratic voter who voted three years ago or going to go to the polls a year from now and say, ah, yeah, let's go with Trump. Mm. (laughs) I had my doubts about him last time, but now I'm okay. You know what I mean? (laughs) And so I just don't see now, and that brings us back to the thing about the third parties, which is why Mm. everyone's salivating over those ideas. Mm. Um, So just all those things together, I just think these, the, the coverage of these polls is interesting. It's good. They did the swing States, but it just doesn't comport with reality. It just doesn't comport with the reality of what's going to be happening next year. Now, if Trump drops out of the race, Mm. then all bets are off and stuff like this. And I don't know, I still think um, the Democrats would win on the merits. I don't see how Nikki Haley is going to be more, um, she's basically running a general election right now. She's being very careful. Oh yeah, she's being very careful. I mean, I think that she could, she, I, I, I think if she was running in general election, she'd probably be slightly more moderate, but not by much. Yeah, yeah they like she's de- 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 careful. She is, she's in every poll. She, she, she does better than Trump does, like in, against Biden. Oh. In every poll, yeah. like she, she is always four or five points better off than Trump is yeah. against Biden. Yeah. Like at this point in time, you would say she would destroy Biden. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, if. Go going by polls, which, yeah. as you said, might be Bobby yeah, They might be, very, <laughs> but, um, but but even in the polls where Biden is winning against Trump, he's losing against Haley. Like yeah, that, oh yeah, that, no, that, 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 no, there, there, are polls polls. Yeah. there are no polls. There are no polls where Biden is beating Haley. Right, and, yeah. right, and no, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up too yeah. because then the second thing is mm. is that you never know. Uh, a lot of times, these places they just hold their fire, you know. Mm. So like the Democrats hardly talked about Bernie Sanders at all. Yeah, right when yeah. he's running against Hillary Clinton yeah. because they want. <laughs> desperately they want Bernie Sanders to be the general election candidate. Mm. They can tar him with communism and Stalinism mm. and all that. So um, none of these candidates are are tested yet on the national stage. No, that's that's, that's, that's um, fair. But, so uh, but, I think there's just all those things and it's just kind of a, it just kind of, uh, like I wrote in the Sydney Morning Herald a while back, we still have no, people have no idea what's going to happen next year. Oh, totally, and totally. I, mean, I, I mean, what I mean is, how insane is we all think it's going to be insane, but it's just going to be yeah. 10 times more insane unless, and I'm not, I don't say this lightly, but if both Trump and Biden drop dead or something, then it might get back to normal. But <laughs> yeah, sure. other than that, it's just going to be complete yeah. insanity. I was just going to say, as a little aside, I can't even think of the angle Democrats would use against Haley. And the reason I say that is because her whole shtick, going back a long way, like this is not, this is not new, her whole shtick for the last 15 years has been, I am very moderate in most respects, except for I am a hardcore neocon. <laughs> She's always been big time neocon. Now, if you're a big time neocon in, 20, in 20, 2006, that's an issue, right? For Democrats and independents. But if you're a big time neocon in 2023, what that means is that you're tough on, uh, on in, in, in the Israel issue and in the Ukraine issue, which is the Democrat position. Yeah. So how are they going to attack her? Yeah, <laughs> like, but I mean, Hillary Clinton was basically mm. a neocon when it came to foreign policy too. Yeah, but I mean, but and everyone was against her then. Well, yeah, th- but I mean that that's okay when you're I a Democrat, point, but yeah. when you're a Republican, yeah. like you know what I mean? Like it's just like if that's the if that's the worst thing that you've got going for you as a Republican in a general election. Yeah. 
it's hard for the Democrats to like the, the worst thing she's got going for it is that she really, really oh. supports Joe Biden on these particular policies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that's, that's really just, true. I, and I, I take your point too. But yeah. now the other thing, though, this is the other. Mm. This is the final. I'm glad you reminded me of this mm. that that there's been this huge realignment of the parties. Mm. Okay, so that a whole bunch of racist bozo Democrats have moved over to the Republican side. Mm. Trump got a lot of people out of the woodwork. Mm. Right, there have been a lot of moderate Republicans, obviously, who moved to you know, supporting Democrats and stuff like that. So what will happen with a quote unquote traditional Republican candidate remains to be seen because a lot of those people are going to go back under the woodwork. I mean, all those Trump people, a lot of them are going to go, eh. Yeah. And so there's going to be this detritus and, and it could be that all the Republicans come home and it's enough to beat. Um, and just out of curiosity, do you think um, Joe Biden should run for reelection? Well, I think, I, th- I think, I mean, this sounds like I'm dodging, but I'll, I'll answer your question. But first of all, I'll just say he is going to run, and so it doesn't matter. Like, and, and for the for the Democrat strategists who keep on saying that, I think it's a good thing to say. Like every time we have that the, the, they have this conversation in public, it only hurts Biden. Yeah. But he's going to run regardless, and so they shouldn't be having this conversation for that reason. Like when when when. Yeah, rich boy, whatever his name is, Dean Phillips, where he goes, well, let's have this conversation. No, that's not a good conversation to have because yeah. he's going to run. So, so it's not a good conversation to have. But to answer your question, should he? Well, I think the best thing Biden could have done would have been to have resigned a year ago to for Kamala Harris to be, to be president for a little while. And if she could make a good fist of it, then good on her. But she probably wasn't going to make a good fist of it, and then she would lose a primary. Oh, that's and a good then point. So, yeah. and then someone else would 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 who would be a much better candidate would be a Democrat candidate against Trump, and they would beat him. That would that that would have been the best thing for the Democrats, I think. But given that he's got to this point now, I think there's no way you can get from here to a different candidate without causing so much damage. It hurts the Democrats. Yeah. So I think he just has to stay. At this point in time, he just has to stay. Yeah. Even I- if he's feeling terrible, he just has to stay. Yeah. At this point in time, I feel. Yeah, I guess you're right. Mm. I really, I mean, I just think Kamala Harris was such a bad candidate. I don't think she'd be that polarizing. And I, I mean, she could turn into this great candidate and run a great campaign. I mean, I don't know. But it is this kind of unfortunate thing that you kind of wish there was a primary in which Newsom and some other people could have a chance. If Biden stepped down now of his own volition, there would be a primary. It wouldn't just be Kamala Harris gets yeah. the crown. Yeah. And it would be an ugly primary. Yeah. Unless Kamala Harris turns out to be a much better candidate than we think. Yeah. Um, it would be an ugly primary, and she would probably lose it, and they would, and the Democrats would probably lose a, a significant portion of the black vote as well as her. At the same, not, not that I'm suggesting they love Kamala Harris, they don't. Yeah. But I think that they would be put off by the results, by by the the nature of the primary and the results of the primary, even though they're not big Kamala yeah. Harris fans. Yeah. And I think it would hurt the Democrats. It would split them up, and it would hurt them. I think. Yeah. At this point in time. I but if agree. but but if she if she had. If she had 18 months as president and was sucking, then it wouldn't have been a problem. But just if it, she doesn't have the chance, if it's just the moment she has her moment, we're trying to take it off her, I think that would go down very badly. That'd be bad. Yeah. But anyway. Can, can I say one last thing about Nikki Haley? Just, yeah, of course I can't you can. believe I'm saying this. Yeah. Vivek Ramaswamy yeah. was right. He was right the, the, in about, the, about, the, the about the TikTok thing. Yeah. Okay, go for it. And which, which everyone completely ran over this. And if yeah, you yeah. remember, um, he said, hey, you've been criticizing TikTok, but your own daughter was on TikTok. Yeah, and yeah. Nikki Haley did the thing, don't talk about your my daughter. And he goes, yeah, of keep course it, you're going to say it out of my vo- keep, keep her name out of your voice. Yeah. And then she <laughs> called it a that scum. Means. Yeah, that's right. But the thing is, is that it's a completely, you know, legitimate thing to say. He could have, and he maybe could have done better. He could have said, hey, um, Governor Haley, does any member of your family mm-hmm. on TikTok? Something like that, but um, but the thing is, she was being hypocritical and coming up there and being glib about it, and and I wouldn't let my kids on TikTok. It completely scares me, mm. and there, it should be actually more of an issue. Ramaswamy is wrong on virtually everything, but I just <laughs> thought that he kind of walked into this buzzsaw, and he, it shows his lack of sophistication and everything. But um, but for the record, she was being hypocritical, and you know she shouldn't let her kid be on TikTok. That's fair enough. Yeah, it's fair enough. Yeah, I, I, all I, I actually spoke to someone on Facebook about this. They they made this point, and, I, and what I said was that I think that I I the, what they were saying was Ramaswamy wasn't attacking her daughter. People were saying he was attacking right. her daughter. He was he was attacking her for being a hypocrite. Yeah, and the and and I said no, I actually I actually agree. He wasn't attacking her daughter. At least he wasn't trying to. I think his wording wasn't great when he said. 
I think he said something like, this is just off the top of my head. I don't have the exact words in front of me, but from memory, he said something like, you should look after your family better or you look after your family more or yeah, something like that. Or, to your own family. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, like it, it, there, was a, there was a real hint of you're a bad mum about what he said, yeah. which I thought, Oh, that that comes off pretty yeah. pretty scummy. I know, and, and what he <laughs> should have said is he said, "Look, it's a very very complicated issue. Mm. We all have family members who are on. I'm sure a lot of people in the yeah. audience. I'm sure yeah. Nikki Haley's own kids are on TikTok. Yeah. You know, yeah. so he could have done it a very clever yeah. way. And the, and the other thing is like but when you're so smart when, when he comes off as I was about to say when he comes off as kind of slimy and skeevy, him even mentioning her daughter just feels a little bit threatening. Yeah. I can say that he's you know, remarkably. Just, the, I mean, he is just the most unattractive major party candidate we've had in a really long time. I mean, because there's been a lot of people like Al Sharpton, to me, is just the most classic buffoonish candidate I've mm. ever seen, right? Mm. But then you had Michelle Bachman, you had all these crazy mm. bozos running on, you know, predominantly in the GOP side, but once in a while on the Democratic side mm. as well. But it's hard to remember a candidate who was just so viscerally... Um, who not only viscerally dislikable, but who has just considered that. I mean, you hear really sober commentators in America just talking about him with just disgust in their voice. Yeah. No, like there's, there's no doubt that he disgusts a lot of people. I mean, personally, I mean, I, I've got a bit of a, I wouldn't say love-hate relationship going with him, but I, I, I like there have now been a collection of maybe five or six times when I've seen him say things that I haven't heard anyone else say. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, that, that's really good. That's really clever. It's really well thought out. It's like you're doing your own thinking for yourself, which is nice. And I like what you say, the fact that you're willing to go out there in, in, a, in a way that, doesn't, that isn't necessarily smart for you but as a political candidate, but it's a really good thought. I like that he does that, but they – but. Yeah, there's a lot of negatives. Yeah. <laughs> okay, like, well, I'm glad yeah. you said that because yeah. I, I was about to say I haven't heard him say anything like that, so now I'm going to go have to crack. Well, I, mean, I, I, I cited one on this podcast the, 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 the other day, about two weeks ago. I cited one where he went out of his way to defend the Harvard, the Harvard kids who were protesting against Israel. The Harvard kids who were getting oh, yeah. who were getting shamed for, for that, and like, and, and people were trying to get the like, like Bill Ackman was trying to get them banned, were trying to get them not hired for proper jobs and stuff. And Vivek was was running the line. Hang on, these are uni kids. Let them, yeah. let them just like feel themselves out. You know, like the, and, and I thought we were against cancel culture. Why are we canceling them? And you said, like, and that does not yeah, help him in the now, Republican yeah. primary. But yeah, yeah good on him. Yeah. Anyway, okay, what's next? Uh, okay, uh, just before you go on to the next topic, I'll uh, just go, there's two quick things I want to say about the election. One is the, the Virginia Senate isn't necessarily locked up; it's still in doubt. And the oh, reason really? for that is because even though the Democrats won one uh, the one extra seat, that seat that they won is <laughs> isn't a bit of doubt because one of the candidates uh, was caught cold breaking the rules. You, you have to live in the in the district that you are a candidate in in Virginia. Uh, she rented an apartment in her in that district. Uh, she signed a cert certificate of candidacy qualification, saying, "I now reside at the address shown below in the district in which I seek office." She listed the apartment address. The form also asked, "Do you or a member of your immediate family, separately or together, hold an interest valued at more than five thousand dollars in real property?" Uh, and she checked no. Ooh. In the box, turns out she's lying. She's owned a house in another district since 1999. Turns out she was living there as well, uh, and we know that because her. I assume it's people related to her opponent, even though they're just random people have made a complaint where they've been stalking her, and uh, they they uh, took uh, they took a note rather than blowing the whistle during the election they waited till she won and uh they uh they've taken note of 62 times during the month of october that she was in the, that she was in the house that that is in the wow. other district including her house her car being there late at night and in the morning and they've got photo evidence every single time and they're like they've they've got her dead to rights so at the very Nicely least done. yeah number one they they've got her at least lying on the form that she owns another property at the very least that is 100 percent and then if they indeed have what they say they have, then they've also got her on not being not living in the, in the district. What happens then? We don't know. Like it's, I, I don't even know who's, who's judging this. Like whether, whether it be a by-election or whether it will be 
and all, like her opponent is going, obviously going for an automatic disqualification, it might just be a fine. I don't know, but I'm just saying that's still in doubt, the Virginia Senate, because oh, it's only by one seat. Yeah, yeah. And I want to tell you very quickly my favourite story of the election, okay. which is vote counting had to stop in a number of booths because some idiots sent out a bunch of mail-in ballots into drop boxes, where at least four of which had traces of fentanyl. Now you might Ooh. go, what, why is that your favourite story? Let me tell you why. It came with these letters that said that read, End elections now. Stop giving power to the right that they don't have. We're in charge now and there is no more need for them. Also be aware your ballot drops are very susceptible to noxious chemicals like AMBL. I don't know what that is. They are unsafe to the public. Just saying. And then there was an Antifa logo, a Progress Pride flag, and a pentagram. <laughs> you can see it wow, right here. Wait a minute. So they were gay and witches yeah. and Antifa. <laughs> That's right. So when, you, you can see as, where I'm oh, going here. Yeah, can I just say something? Really yes. Really? yes. As, as the great actor Edmund Garrick once said, yeah. when he was informed that Samuel Johnson was running around Oxford with yeah. a gay blade, yeah. what a coalition. <laughs> That's right. I mean, if you get the Wiccans, the Antifa. <laughs> yeah, you can't lose. And um, who was the third one? The... Uh, um, uh, the, Wickens, um, and Tifa, oh, and the gays and, and the LGBTQ, so yeah, gay, yeah, witch, yeah. and yeah. Tifas. Yeah, that's right. That's 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 quite. That's, that they're certainly winning the the diversity Olympics. That, that, that those people now that they don't sound to me like a real person. I got to say that they're, they're all those three. Yeah. They sound to me like a right wing cliche. That's what they sound to me like. Um, also, the letters were sent to Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, and Fulton County, Georgia. First of all. <laughs> They're all blue places, right? Why would you be trying to stop the elections that you're winning anyway? I know they said we're in charge now, but it doesn't make any sense. Why would lefties want to stop elections where they're winning? Number two, they're these they're all these Western places that are close to each other. And then Fulton County, Georgia. You go, well, I wonder why they'd pick Fulton County, Georgia. It just happens to be the county that Trump is obsessed with <laughs> because, number one, that's the, that's the center of voter fraud USA as far as he's concerned, and also where he's been charged in his current indictment as well. So he's, he's got all kinds of issues with Fulton County, Georgia. So that, to me, also reeks of a right-winger as well. Um, who hates drop boxes? Is it... Is it Democrats or is it Republicans? I think we know which one. <laughs> so who would want to sabotage drop boxes? Uh, uh, and also fentanyl. Lefties don't talk about fentanyl. It's, it's the conservatives that are obsessed with fentanyl. Fox News is obsessed with fentanyl poisoning. So you put them all together and you go, okay, none of these actions make sense from a lefty's perspective. But every single reference and action here is dripping with right-wing cliches. This is the most obvious false flag I've ever seen yeah, in my life. That's so, so funny. So I'm calling it right now. You heard it here first on Pep. In two years' time, get ready to see a tearful Twitter troll bemoaning the fact that no one has a sense of humour anymore and they're just sending him to jail for 10 months because he's conservative and whatever happened to free speech, just get ready for it. It's good because they're going to catch him for sure and they're going to go to jail for a long time and it's going to be, oh, come on, no one's got a sense of humour anymore. Anyway, so look out for that. I love that story. That's hilarious. (laughs) Um. Uh, did you have something else? No, I want to get to the next mention, topic. This is just, just reminded me of a footnote for some reason from Please. you guys talking a few yeah, yeah. weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, this really interesting issue, mm-hmm. if Trump gets convicted of something, will he go to jail? Yes. Okay, and what did you think? Uh, I think I think he won't go to jail. I yeah. think I think at worst he'll get he'll get home detention, but yeah. I don't think he'll go to jail. Yeah, and I remember you guys talking about that, and mm-hmm. this is just one of those things that once in a while there's – Things I just noticed talking to news people here, like when I remember when Trump mm-hmm. got COVID just before the election, mm-hmm. I was talking to someone, you know, and you know, incredibly, everyone here just knows so much about everything, right? Mm-hmm. But they said, oh, they're going to have to postpone the election. And I said, mm-hmm. well, they're not going to do that. Well, they have to because, mm-hmm. you know, he has COVID. I mean, how can you mm-hmm. hold an election? It's like, there's an election. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? There's no, no one, there's no mechanism to postpone mm-hmm. an election. You mm-hmm. just, it just won't happen. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the election isn't like, oh, as long as everyone's feeling healthy that day in the Constitution. It says yeah. there's an election on the, the yeah. first Tuesday in November, the whatever, mm. the first Tuesday after first Monday. Um, and then there is this interesting aspect that with this. And the thing is, you really could be right and there could be appeals and all mm. sorts of crazy things that could happen. However, just the way the court systems work, like when you get convicted, you go to jail. Mm. Like, and if he isn't going to go to jail, something outside is going to have to happen, mm. right? Like, it's not like, oh... 
oh, we really want to sentence them, but we're going to talk to everyone and decide whether he goes to jail. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's just this process and there's a very deep seated American thing. And granted, a lot of American things are going out the window, but no one's above the law. Mm. You know, that there's, there's going to be this huge feeling in America and particularly amongst judges mm. because, you know, for notwithstanding how corrupt some of them are these days, that's what they do. You know, mm. they live to put a senator or a city council person or a famous person in jail. They really honestly mm. do. Mm. And what happens, a lot of famous people get good lawyers and they get off like Michael Jackson mm. or R. Kelly and stuff like that. But um, the thing is, if Trump goes into one of these things and he gets sentenced and they say, you know, we're going to sentence to four years from jail and you're going to have to serve whatever, 36 months or something like that, like they have to figure out some way not to get that to happen. So mm. that's just... It's not to say you won't be right, yeah, but yeah. the mechanism is going to be, there's going to have to be some extraordinary outside forces because the judge isn't going to go, well, you guys figure it out. Whatever you want is okay with me. Mm. The judge is going to say, you're going to jail. Mm. And so how that might not happen is really confusing to me. I don't know how that'll happen. Well, what I would say is that I think that the that the Chutkin case in, in Washington, um, the, the January 6th case, I think... She would be absolute. She would absolutely send him to jail. I'm sure about that. Right. Um, but I'm not sure he's going to be found guilty in that one. I think he's definitely going to be found guilty in Florida. But then he's got Eileen Cannon as his judge, who's his best mate. Yeah, that one I think is yeah. going to take a long time. I yeah. was thinking Chuckin's going to come up first. Yeah, oh, and, I think it will too. And I don't know. She's mm. the one doing all those. That's the thing about her. She's been handling all these cases. And how can she look to all those bozo but, followers and say, "Oh, you go to jail, but not him"? But like I said, I'm not sure he's going to be found guilty. She's not. She's not. She's not judging it. It's a. It's a. It's a jury. Mm. She's not up to her yeah. whether he's found guilty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think if he's found guilty. In that case, yeah, he's going to jail. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure about that. But just yeah, that's the one which I've got some doubts about. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying he definitely won't be found guilty, yeah. but I'm just saying that that one I'm not sure of. Right? I'm absolutely sure he'll be found guilty in yeah. Florida and in Georgia. Yeah. He really, I mean, that's another thing. I mean, granted, that case could turn into yeah. a six month long circus, yeah. and you know what? We, none of us know what's two, happening. Two year long circus. Yeah. Seriously. But let's but let's keep on going because the next topic was Trump legals, and I know you want to talk about the Fourteenth Amendment. So go for um, it. Oh, yeah, the 14th Amendment yeah. case, people could just might be interested in this, that mm. it's kind of a sideshow. And what it is, there's a section of the 14th Amendment mm. that says it was it was passed after the Civil War, mm. and it basically said, look, if you were participating in an insurrection against the United States, uh, you're ineligible to serve mm. in office, mm. okay? And it was used against a lot of Civil War people. And then ironically, I'm not a huge historical expert, but my understanding is after a few years, Congress, that you could, like two-thirds of Congress could say, ah, that guy's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so they started doing that, okay? Because mm. you can imagine how Congress would do that. And that was a very complicated reconstruction. It was a complicated period. But anyway, a lot of enterprising people have said, hey, this is in the Constitution. If you've, you know, if you've participated in insurrection or aided an embedded one, um, you can't run for office anymore. Mm. Okay. So Joe, um, Secretary of State in various states, has been saying, hey, I'm not going to put this guy in the ballot because he, he went after an insurrection. I guess this is happening 24 states so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've got people who are basically saying this. And we have to remember that unlike in Australia, you know, the states, the, the elections in America, presidential elections are handled on the state level. Yes. Okay, so it's a very complicated process, but um, the United States government can, can't say, oh, this is how you do it. The states all do it. And they say, hey, this is who we, mm -hmm. the electors that were going to support this president, as we learned three years ago. So... Um, there's been this. There's been all this litigation, and now it's active in two states, right? Wisconsin and Colorado. Mm. So now it's very, it's a little more complicated than that because the big legal question, again, you're a lawyer, sort of, I'm not, um, is that is it this legal concept of self-executing? Mm. Okay, meaning do you have to be convicted, or does it just happen on its face? And mm. Joe, Secretary of State, and Secretaries of States in American states, that's a political office underneath the governor, mm. they're the ones who traditionally are responsible for elections. Mm. So can some just Secretary of State in some random state say, hey, I'm not putting this guy in the ballot? Mm. And on, you know, you put that in a couple of states, and all of a sudden, particularly in a swing state, and there's no way that that person can become 270 electoral mm. votes, right? So, so it's two separate questions, is A, um, is this law self-executing that a, that a secretary of state can do it? And B, 
what happens if they do. Mm. Okay, so that happens. So um, this is active right now in these two states. It's being argued, and I think, and in one, I think in Wisconsin, it automatically goes to the state Supreme Court, and in Colorado, it's going up to these other cases, and it's all very complicated. And I bring all this up just to say that you're going to be hearing a lot of it over the next year because it's literally happening in 24 states. And what's going to happen is at some point, it's going to be the United States Supreme Court, and they're going to say no. Mm. They're going to say, G O. F O. <laughs> no, G T F O. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay. And don't yeah. let the door hit you on the way yeah. out. Okay. Yeah. There's no way in American politics, Joe Secretary of State in Nevada, Arizona, Colorado, Wisconsin, or Guam, anywhere is going to say that a certain person can't be on the ballot and completely disrupt the, the elections in America. It's just I agree. literally never going to happen. It's just, mm. and it's just so funny because you get caught up in this, you listen to all these podcasts oh, this yeah. is, and you go, wait a minute, yeah. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So you might yeah. read all these articles and listen mm. to all these podcasts, all these lawyers are going to talk till the cows come home about self-executing and stuff like this. And it's going to go to the Supreme court and they're going to say, go away. Yeah. We have, so many other things to worry. We we have to destroy the internet. <laughs> we might be helping put, put you know Trump on a very other levels, yeah. and we have to take voting rights away from people. <laughs> and we're looking very seriously about blacks and whites sleeping together, which we don't like. And don't get us started on sodomy. Okay, but you are not doing that. Period. Fair enough. Look, I I, I agree. I agree. The fact that everything you said, apart from, I probably wouldn't characterize the Supreme, for the Supreme Court quite the same way you have, but that's okay. I agree with pretty much everything you said then in that I think that, I think that, that many states are going to, there are, they're, yeah, they're just going to keep on taking shots until one of them comes off. Many states aren't, aren't going to let them get through. Uh, for, and we've, we just saw just now a classic example of what we're going to see a lot of over next year, which is in Minnesota. That was the first one to get through. It was actually in Minnesota. The Minnesota Supreme Court. Oh, heard, sorry, say not Wisconsin. No, right. no, no, no. Look, they're going in every state. Yeah, that they'll go in Wisconsin yeah. at one point in time. Wisconsin, and Minneapolis, <laughs> right next to you. They're they're hugging each other. Uh, Minnesota has already dismissed it. It took one week for them to go. No, nah, no, nah, see you later. And the reason for that, the Minnesota, they went straight to the Minnesota, Minnesota Supreme Court. They dismissed it immediately. Uh, it was a four-page order. They dismissed all just not. Nah. <laughs> and they and the reason for that, they didn't address any of the constitutional issues. They didn't bother. They didn't, they didn't address any of the questions, any of the issues. All they said was, there's no Minnesota law that prohibits a major political party from placing on the primary ballot or nominating a candidate who's ineligible to hold office. It's fine. You can nominate a cat if you want. There's nothing in the-, in the oh, right. oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. you're right. I'm yeah. sorry. I totally forgot about this. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They said, but but see, they didn't They didn't decide on the merits. That's no, the thing. They, 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 said, they, yeah, they, like, they didn't, they didn't yeah. look at the merits at all. They just said- they just said this, this. This is not a legitimate case because you can put anyone on the uh, on the primary ballot. Come back to us during uh, uh, if he wins the general election, and right. then then we'll tell you. Right, and, and again, <laughs> just to explain to people that it is a very complicated thing in America mm. because because the the elections are overseen on the state level, right? Mm. But the actual elections mm. are actually party elections, yes, right. And so it's like they kind of run. Like the ind- the primaries are run by the parties. Like mm. it's really not a public thing, mm. but the state kind of oversees it for some weird, bizarre reason. So yeah. that's another thing that the primary elections are slightly askew. Mm. They're not quite. So you can see why the courts would say that, but they didn't decide it on the merits. No, no. But what I'm saying is that's not the only way you can get rid of a case without deciding on the merits. What you're going to see over the next year is a thousand different ways of telling of telling these people to go away which either don't don't interact with the merits or if they do interact with the merits, just come up with some technic- technicality where you go, oh, no, this, is, yeah. this doesn't apply for whatever reason. And like, and they, because the, no one wants to deal with this shit. No one does. And so every court is going to go, no, 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 no. Eventually some court is going to be forced to have to deal with it because these people every single time, it's like evolution. Every single time their case is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. <coughs> Eventually, one's going to get through the Supreme Court, and then they're going to try and dismiss it for, for on technical reasons. But eventually, eventually, either they will be if, if, like if they're forced to interact with the merits, they're just going to go no, like because they, they, because they're, I, on this podcast we've st- stated about four different reasons why they could say no if they wanted to. Yeah, like the I'm not saying that that. That, that that is the best interpretation of the law. I'm just saying it's available to them, and if yeah. they don't want to bother. 
it's available to them. And I promise you, they don't want to bother. Right. So, yeah, no, so, I, I take your point. Yeah, but the yeah. thing is, I think it's going to get up to the Supreme Court ASAP. And the court is actually going to say, give a firm decision on it because they don't want it. It's going to disrupt the election. Okay, they're, going well, to, they're, going to, they're going to say, no, this is a pressing issue and it's going to come back at us. So we're not going to decide it on the narrowest. This, this is where I disagree with you. Okay. But then secondly, <laughs> um, but the other take, thing is, is that um, um, the... <laughs> Was I going to say the mm. the motivation for this is so sad because it really is a bunch of bozos because they they're they're just going to do it to the if 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 it did happen then the other side would just do it right mm. I mean that then people are going to start doing to Joe Biden you know that he you know whatever that Hunter Biden was in insurrections or something <laughs> so um, <laughs> yeah. there's actually going to be no stomach for it really mm. on either side and um, so well let's see what's happening because I think that as soon as possible it's going to go up to um, <coughs> It's going to go up um, to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is going to make a flat thing. And I and the only thing I could think of is that I think to your point, what would happen is that a state could say if someone's been co- convicted of aiding and abetting or something like mm. this or impeached, then and then they they're allowed to make that decision, mm. and then that will go up to the Supreme Court, and they'd say, well, this is how nuanced and how narrow the 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 law. Mm. Um, um, has to be or something like that. You can't do it for jaywalking. You can't do it for you know, twisting Bob Rathenberger's arm or something like that. It has to be violent, you know, whatever. Um, that I can see taking years, but I'll bet you anything early next year, they're going to say, will you please stop this, you idiots? <laughs> and I don't think true. the Supreme Court is going to be very friendly to Donald Trump on anything else. Mm. But on this one, they're just going to... Yeah, no, um, I agree. It's very scary and it just drives everyone crazy. Now, I am determined to get my social media stuff in because okay, I've been I've been doing this I've been putting this off now for eight weeks. Okay. So I'm going to I might not get all of it, but we're at least going to start. So I'm going to, I'll start on it now. Then we'll come back to more Trump trial stuff because I know you want to talk about the New York corporate trial as well. Oh, maybe the the anger on yeah, trial. Yeah. So so let's start with the social media stuff. Then we'll go back to that, and then we can go back to social media, and then we can go to some of the other topics you've got. Okay. I want to make sure we get to as many. Uh, like uh, you're not in a huge rush, so that's cool. So we can go over yeah, time a I bit. Another half hour or so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Well. Forty five minutes. Good. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's uh, so start with social media. Okay. Case one because 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 we talked brought the Supreme Court. This entire Supreme Court term is going to be related to social media. There's so many social media cases. It's one after another after another. So I want, I, want, I want Judge Wyman to sit in here. Okay. And they had to rule on a few of these. Okay, so case one. There's actually two cases in the first, in the first section, which is O'Connor, Ratcliffe and Zane is one, and Freed versus Linky is the other one. Now, in the first one, they're both involved in the same topic, which is the first one had these, these parents called the Garniers who were parents of students and they started posting lengthy and often uh, uh, O'Connor, Rutcliffe and Zanny were on the school board, right? And they were, and these parents were posting lengthy and often repetitive criticisms of the board on, in, in, in response to their tweets, right? Okay. Uh, and when I say repetitive, I mean one of the parents posted 226 identical replies to O'Connor Ratcliffe's Twitter page. <laughs> One to each tweet, tweet that O'Connor Ratcliffe had ever written on her public account. Okay, so they're really pains in the asses, right? These parents, right? Just hassling, hassling, hassling. So O'Connor Ratcliffe blocked these parents from her Facebook page and she blocked one of them on Twitter. Uh, Zane also blocked the parents on Facebook. Same parents hassling both of them, right? The parents then sued, <laughs> showing just how much of a pain in the ass they were, claiming that, that they have a First Amendment right to post public comments responding to their elected officials. So that's, that's the first case. The second case, Freed versus Linky. Freed is a city manager in Michigan. Freed blocked Linky after he posted comments that were critical of Freed's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, uh, Linky uh, also claims he has a First Amendment right to continue posting comments on Freed's Facebook page. Now, the question is, on all these, the question is, are they working as government officials on their Twitter page or not? Because if they're working as government officials, if they're government official accounts, treat as government official accounts, then they have no leg to stand on as far as the First Amendment goes. You can't restrict people's speech in any way, shape or form as a government official, right? Um, but if it's their private account, if they're, if they're personal accounts, then they can do whatever they like, right? And, and the courts distinguish, gave the example of a police officer who's not on duty anymore telling their friend to shut up. That's fine. 
But if they're wearing a uniform and they tell someone to shut up, then that might be a free speech issue, right? right. So the, uh, it, it, yeah. are they working in their capacity as a government official or not? Okay. In the first case, the one with the 200 and 226 identical replies, uh, the Ninth Circuit said they were using their accounts as government officials. Right, because they so blocking them, blocking those people was inconsistent with the First Amendment. They'd only used, they only had three personal items on their accounts. And so they said that is just basically a government account. Yeah. The other one is more like 50 50. <coughs> the other case, and so they found that he did not, that did not consist of state action. It was kind of a personal account where he was doing some government activity on, but it was a personal account. They, they said. Then, then it went to the Supreme Court. Uh, because you know, these two were seemingly conflicting results. So they went to the Supreme Court to harmonise. And Elena Kagan immediately went straight to the Trump precedent. Because you might recall a couple of years back, Trump was, was, was uh, the Supreme Court held that he couldn't block people, right, on his account. Um, so that's fair enough, I guess. She quoted approvingly of the appeals court saying, once the president has chosen a platform and opened up its interactive space to millions of users and participants, he may not selectively exclude those whose views he disagrees with. The defendant's lawyers, they said that Trump was different though because he used a government staffer to help him run his page. These people were just, they're just, yeah. just schlubs with a, with a Twitter account, right? Kagan said, makes no difference whatsoever, she said. Um, and then she said, I don't think a citizen would be able to really understand the Trump presidency without any access to all the things that the president said on that account. It was an important part of how he wielded his authority and to cut a citizen off from that is to cut a citizen off from part of the way that they, their government works. The defendant's lawyers said that Trump's Twitter was like a campaign rally where he might make official announcements. That doesn't make the campaign rally a government forum where people have a constitutional right to enter. Uh, they said public officials retain their First Amendment rights to decide who can participate in the community discussion that they host at their own property, like Mar-a-Lago, for instance. So they are they are free to block users from their personal social media pages unless they choose to operate those pages in their official capacity instead. Roberts and Alito said that the idea of, of property is archaic in this case when you're talking about social media. They said property has got nothing to do with social media and all that matters is the function that they're performing. What does Wyman J say? That's so interesting. Okay, so, okay, this is how I analyze it. And there's two things there. There's what it should be and what the court will do. Okay. Okay. Because we so don't the know yet. They haven't that, given their ruling yet. Um, is that um, I disagree with the thing about the 50%. Like the thing is, if it's an account that has any governmental or public affairs part of it, it's obviously someone who is... Um, engaging to some extent on a personal account. If you want mm. a personal account, you can lock it down, mm. just like a Facebook thing, and just do it talk between you and your family, and no mm. one else has to see it. Um, but what there's going to be, ideally, that the proper analysis is that there should there has to be a very very strict standard mm. for um, anything involving a First Amendment issue. You know, and so yeah. is there an easier way to do it? Yeah. And is there a very high reason for it? And in neither case. Is there anything like this? And in fact, what they can certainly do is they can say, hey, this is a public account. I'm sick of this person, but it's part of my job. You guys, if you don't like them, just block them and you won't even see the guy's things. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that way you'll be in peace. You can hear me. I can handle him. You know, there's so many easy ways to get around these issues that would not lend to the point where a government can say, oh, it's actually stop someone from participating. But, but when you block them, you're stopping them from participating. Oh, right. No, but you, but let's say it's me. Okay. Yeah. Let's say yeah. I'm a city council member and yeah. you're the guy coming yeah. on. Yeah. I would say, you know what? I'm a city council person. I welcome your spewing of all that nonsense. It's part of my life. Yeah. Bring it on. Mm. Everyone else though, you guys can block Chaz and I encourage you to do oh, that. Oh, I see. Gotcha. So yeah. You okay, don't okay. have to gotcha. deal with it. Okay. Yeah. Like okay, that's yeah, just yeah. a very yeah. simple way. Yeah. And now if the judges get to that level, mm. I don't know, but it just shows you there's so many easy ways to work around this yes. um, that, that it will never, ever any sane First Amendment, mm. strong First Amendment court, which we actually have, would do that. Okay, now, this court is very weird because the court is so pro-First Amendment mm. that when Obama brought on Kagan, they didn't bother to say, hey, what's your First Amendment issues with social media? Mm. And it turns out she's a crazy person, okay? <laughs> and which I think we're going to talk about in the next one. Mm. And so... Um, so traditionally, the court, we've got to remember, this is the Citizens United Court, even mm. worse, mm. And so they they should be six to nine or seven to nine votes traditionally for 
um, a basic First Amendment case like mm. this. But since you have Thomas, who's crazy right now, and Alito, mm. who's crazy, and then mm. you have Kagan, so all of a sudden you have three mm. who might do this. But I still basically think it would be 5-4 or 6-3 saying, just get the hell out of here. You're a public figure. You, you know, you can't stop people from talking. Mm. And like I said, I think when they drill down on that guy's thing, they're, they can say, hey, if you have any governmental stuff, if you're talking about public affairs and drumming up things, you know, tough Nugents, if you, if you want a personal Twitter account, just lock it down and talk amongst you and your friends. That's fine. But mm. if you're in public, you can't, you can't get the benefits of being a public official in a public forum. You know, you can make the analogy to um, what happened with the Trump case originally. It's the analogy of like a public square where the, the candidate's talking. Mm. And if that's the way you're communicating with the public um, in this public platform, you can't be excluding people. It's much different. You know, mm. online is much different from. Um, and the other thing is, is you can actually do that online. <laughs> that's the mm. thing. You can just do it a, a, your own thing and say, hey, this is a Twitter feed that's invitation only. I don't think that is a violation of the First Amendment, but you can't have one where you can selectively block people. Okay, that's my ruling. Okay. What about you? Right. How do okay. you feel about it? Okay, well, first of all, what they will do, I think is exactly what you said. Oh. I, th- I agree with you, what they will do. Well, I, what, let me tell you, let me talk through what I think they should do. Okay, first of all, number one, this, uh, let me just say as a little aside, this shows why America has so many issues. Like how psychotic would you need to be to take someone to the Supreme Court because they blocked you on Twitter? <laughs> like that's only in America that they do that. Right? It's um, um, America's full of these kinds of people. That's why they hate each other because they because they they're prepared to escalate all the way, all the way at each other. Yeah, you know? um, and uh, and civil society requires de-escalation in my view, but um. And, and and escalation re- re- results in perverse results. But anyway, leave that aside. I think they're very confused in their arguments. Those arguments I put forth are very confused because they're talking about whether you can read Trump's announcements or not. They're talking about whether, like, when you read Trump, if you can't read Trump's announcements, how can you understand his presidency? The First Amendment has nothing to do with with, with information you receive. It's about information you say. It's about the information you're putting out. It's about whether you have the right, like the First Amendment guarantees your right to speak, not your right to get information. Like, and so, so them saying, them saying, how can you possibly understand the Trump presidency if you're not, if if you're blocked? Who cares? That has nothing to do with the First Amendment. So you see what I mean? That's a, just a complete irrelevant argument. Yeah, but yeah, I think that there's other issues. There's like the the peaceably to assemble and like I. I, I, I hear your argument, but I don't think that really enters into it. I could really be wrong. Oh, oh I'm, I'm not saying that there aren't, there aren't relevant arguments in the things I just said. I just think, I think some of them are confused and okay. that, that for, the, for that reason, right? So I just want to just, just, just state that. Um, and also, you can, you can look at his Twitter page even when you're blocked. Right. No, see, it's that's really another, easy. That's another issue too. <laughs> I, I was going to say that too because there's all these things about social media that justices and people yeah. don't understand. Yeah, like the, I said, you can just tell people to block. Yeah, them. yeah. The the only thing that 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 blocking someone removes it removes the right for them to comment under their own name. Right. That's the only thing it does. Yeah. Other than that, you have every other right. Yeah, so, but it is stopping that person from participating and under um, their own name. It does, they it can they sort, can they can open sort another of account an onus to say, "Oh, I'm not allowed to participate. I have to kind of hide." Yeah. It's like I can peek in through the window, but I'm not allowed to talk. Sure, sure. But I, I wouldn't say it's a it's a huge imposition, I would say. But right. having said that, what I would say is that I think you need to have I mean there's a there's a common thread with a lot of these, which is there are a lot of moderations out there, right? There are millions and millions of moderations and you really don't want the court to have to have to judge between hundreds and thousands of different cases and go, oh, well, this one, this one, this one, this one's a bit like this, this one's a bit like that. You want to have a hard and fast law, right? Like a ruling. So everyone can see black and white. This is okay, this is not okay. To me, the simplest test, if it's a personal account, if it's a government account is, did you have the account before you were a government official? Are you going to have the account after you're a government official? If the answer is yes to those, then it's a personal account. If the answer is no, if, if, if you only get that account while you're a government official, then it's a government account. I don't care what you put on there. I don't care if you put personal or government or whatever. If, if it, I don't see how, like let's, just, let's say, let's, let's take my Twitter account right now. That I've posted all this kind of stuff, whatever. I don't do much Twitter, but anyway, if I become the prime minister tomorrow, but keep on using the same account, are you saying that that account suddenly just changes 
to be a gov- an official government account. When well, if exactly- all of a sudden you're talking about stuff and you're making fun of mm. legislators, you're drumming up support. Hey, I need everyone to get down to the courthouse but, tomorrow. And but there's also me. a prime minister's account. Right, but if on your personal account you're yeah. doing it to yeah, yeah, round up, yeah. well, it well, is a, it is kind of like oh, I'm just going to talk to my people, but you're not allowed to talk back. Yeah, to yeah, me. yeah. Well, I mean, that, that, I mean, that, look, I mean, that is obviously the line that the Supreme Court is running. They, they they're, yeah. they're saying it's about the function; it's not about anything yeah. else. So I understand what they're saying, but that that if I was ruling, that's what I would do. Yeah. I would say it's a personal account if it was your account beforehand, and it will be account your account afterwards. Yeah. If not. It's the government. That's what I would do, but yeah. I don't think they will do that. I think they'll do exactly what yeah. you said, which so, is free speech. Yeah. And one point I want to make, though, what you said about this yeah. is so America that there's someone who takes this up at the Supreme yeah. Court. Yeah, yeah. I would look at it slightly differently. Like it's so America that there's someone who makes it go all the way up to the Supreme Court. Yeah, like yeah, why yeah. couldn't the guy just say, and this reminds me, I used to work at this paper called the Chicago Reader in Chicago, and this mm. is back before the internet, and it was mm. a really big kind of famous paper, and I was a columnist, mm. right? And got a lot of letters. And the reader had this policy that, Letter writers got to write in and you didn't get to respond unless it was a factual issue. And then you had to say, oops, you were right, I'm sorry, or no, I'm right, here's why, thanks mm. very much for writing. Mm. And you know what I mean? That's mm. like, that's the kind of attitude you should have. I mean, yeah. you know, again, this is before the internet and like, mm. you know, being a columnist, you're really cool, you get to do all this fun stuff and people get to write in and say, you're an idiot all the time. And you know what? That's what they get. And that's the kind of attitude, you know, people in politics should say, hit me, give me what you got on social media. I'm going to be respectful. And, um, but like I said, the clever way to do it is to say to your followers, I'm not going to block that guy. You guys do it. We'll move on. I agree. Okay. Well, I'm okay. Jay. We've got, we've got another case here. This is. Oh, this is the exciting one. Yeah. This is, this is net, uh, net choice V Paxton and Moody V, v net choice. What, man, what's going now? Net choice V Paxton is, a, is based on a Texas law. The Texas law says that social media platforms may not censor speech based on viewpoint at all. And it defines censorship to include not just deletion, but also any steps that make user posted content less visible, accessible, or lucrative. Greg Abbott said when he passed it, it is now law that conservative viewpoints in Texas cannot be banned on social media. So to be clear here, they're not saying you can't moderate. They're saying you can't moderate based on viewpoint. Okay, so if someone has, if someone simply has a, someone breaks some some rule, sure you can moderate them. Like it, you can take down porn or whatever. But if but if simply that you disagree with their viewpoint or, or you're offended by their viewpoint, you cannot take that po- that post down or that yeah or that or, or that account down. Uh, Moody versus Net Choice was based on a Florida law, very similar except it's slightly different. The Florida law involves a state forcing social media platforms to host speech by any candidate for office. So it's only political, right? And, so, and I think uh, public newspapers too. And I mean, news organizations, yes, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, the law says platforms may not limit the visibility of material by or about a political candidate and may not censor deplatform platform or shadow ban a journalistic enterprise, that's what you're referring to, based on the content of its publication or broadcast. Okay, so this one was struck down by the 11th Circuit. The Texas one was upheld by the 5th Circuit. So now they're coming together in the Supreme Court, and this is going to probably be the biggest case of the the Supreme Court term. Uh, I should say both only apply to large platforms, and both laws are enforced by lawsuits. No one's going to jail here, but but the Floridas, for instance, uh, you get sued for $100,000. You can get sued for potentially $100,000. Texas has smaller fines, but still enforced by fines. Okay. Wyman J. <laughs> okay, I get put on the spot. Okay, so this one is so funny. And what people should know is that these are not serious laws, mm. right? This isn't something where a bunch of people got together and said, hey, how can we take care of this? And this is a brave new world. Let's mm. figure it out. Mm. These are um, put together by, you know, wackos on the right. <laughs> They're designed to raise money and let DeSantis and, you know, Abbott and mm. Paxton. Paxton is the, the attorney general, um, attorney in general Texas, of yeah. Texas. Yeah. And, um, and both of them are, are kind of crazy. Mm. Okay. So, so that's just one thing you should be aware of that. Mm. Um, and then the fifth circuit, if mm. I recall, okay, that decision, there was all sorts of Michigan with it, but finally the guy went and did it mm. and it was insane. Yeah. Okay. The fifth, the fifth circuit is generally insane. Yeah. yeah. But this particular judge, mm. um, 
and again, I'm not a huge legal expert, but I did read a couple of things about this. And there was apparently this very, very funny thing where he mm -hmm. said, um, well, for this case, I'm going to go back and look at the origins of the First Amendment and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to be held to any of these recent Supreme Court decisions on the matter. <laughs> I'm just going to go back to the mm -hmm. founders. Yeah. And I've just heard some funny lawyers mm -hmm. just saying, that's, you know, that's what you're supposed to do is you're mm -hmm. supposed to, if you're a judge, you say, okay, what are the recent decisions on this yeah. issue? I mean, that's literally your job. So yeah. it was pretty crazy out there. And the guy was obviously a Fox News kind of weirdo guy. Yeah. Um, this is all, first of all, I mean, so just for the record, it's all whining and craziness on the part of the right. Mm -hmm. Now, all that said, this is a very, very complicated issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there are these pernicious al algorithms that go on, stuff like this. Um, however, the number one irony of this, of course, is that the beneficiary of all this over the past 10 years has been the right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Particularly the most awful parts of the right and trolls and international operators and things like that um, doing things anonymously that to help the right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's one of these classic things that are coming to the right that they get away with all this crazy stuff. And then they go around whining that they're getting treated poorly when in fact they've been the beneficiary of it. And, and I say this as someone who's been on social media mm -hmm. and you can see it's absolutely overrun with, you know, all this kind of craziness, stuff like this it's been weaponized on that much more than on the left. Um, though to some extent it has existed, of course, on the left. So, um, so, so just legally, it's crazily. Morally, it's crazily. Fact-wise, it's going to be hugely questionable. Um, all that said, what's sad about it is there are some real issues that they could, you know, they, steps they could take. And the very simplest one, which is just this, there's an actual interesting element of the Florida Bible law about transparency, mm -hmm. which is another whole complicated issue. But they they want. Um, they want all this transparency in the in the algorithms, stuff like that, which is great, which is a decent part of the law. But what they should basically say is like, look, well, we're going to algorithm your guys, um, um, your asses, t to the till the cows come home. However, we're going to give everyone a chance to opt out of them, mm. to where say on Facebook, look, I just want to see what my buddy Chaz and my mom and my cousin and my wife and my friends put. And I don't want to be a victim of all these algorithms. All they have to do is say to people, hey, you can opt out. You're just going to see what your friends do. And we're not going to give you all the all the stuff about, you know, to stir you up because our all algorithms, the reason they do it is because they're trying to increase engagement. They yeah. know that if they put a bunch of things of, if you're a cat lover and it starts feeding you stuff, a kitten's getting hurt, you're going to get all engaged and start mm. sending it out to everyone, say how outrageous it is mm. and check your feed every morning mm. to see if anyone replied to you, which is what they do. They stir people up. So, um, so again, we get back to, we get up to the Supreme court, like where, you know, where are the valences going to be mm. hitting Kagan, I think is going to be out where the trains don't run with Thomas mm. and, I don't know who else. I'm not a super expert on that, but I still think it's going to come down against it because they're both silly laws mm. on like all those different levels. And so they're going to say, look, there's no factual basis for it. There's no factual establishment based on it. Again, because it's going to have to be this, um, these two things, you know, it's going to be, is there any other way to achieve this end besides stifling speech? And does it meet this extraordinarily high standard? Like is the harm at the standard? And they're not going to meet any of those things. Um, and then finally, the um, um, then there's going to be this whole issue about how they're going to they might be common carriers, yes. like like a telephone or something yes. like that. Yeah, yes. And and what people are going to say, look at like let's talk about MySpace, let's talk about Bandcamp, let's talk about all these famous, powerful social media companies that are no longer there, mm -hmm. and a social media company that doesn't serve its users. Another one's going to come up, and there's so many other ways. You know, you can send out your your message on email and on a million other things and stuff like that. And the one thing that is really scary, which is that, you know, they can say, look, it's not just Facebook. Facebook is Messenger. It's Facebook. It's Instagram and mm. WhatsApp. That's crazy. You know, and so I think they would have this argument saying, look, this consolidation is very scary. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, they'd say, look, it's going up against Google. It's going to go up against Apple. Google's going to say, hey, we don't do that kind of thing on our platforms. So you can come here and stuff like that. And obviously, you know, that's what Trump was trying to do on Trump Social. You know, let the marketplace do it. So so it's going to be very difficult for them to throw over their whole free market principles. And which is, you know, it's a very pro First Amendment court. So I kind of don't think it's going to go anywhere. What about you? I agree. It's not going to go anywhere. I think both it it won't and it shouldn't go anywhere. Yeah. Like I'm, I agree with them on this. I think that this is a really clear First Amendment issue for the social media companies. They, they have the freedom of speech as well. Yeah. And you shouldn't be forcing them to 
to to run people on their platforms that they don't want to run on their platforms. Yeah, and, and yeah. let me just interject to people because yeah. maybe we didn't make this clear. That's really what it is. It's the government mm. going in and like it's just a it's just a standard of First Amendment law. The government can't tell a newspaper, a news site to run something yeah. or not to run something. Like it's just it's their business. If people don't like it, they can go to another news site. So totally. this is a very core fundamental thing. And the only way to get over that is say, oh, they're really not publishers. Yeah. Well, this is this is what you were touching on before when you were referring to common carriers. People might not have heard that phrase before. That's referring to saying like this is the classic argument because these kind of moderation decisions have been going for long before the internet. And the the classic argument is going one hand, there's if you treat them like a publisher, then they have a then they have a, a view, a point of view, and they might be held responsible for that point of view. Uh, but it, Otherwise, you might treat them like they're, when they say refer to a common carrier, they're referring to like basically like a service, like a phone line or a train track or whatever, where every single person gets to go on it. And in which case, then they don't have a point of view. But at the same time, you need to let every single person go on it. That's what a common carrier is. Um, and I would say that, that, that Twitter is not a common carrier for a number of reasons. The first thing is that the, mo- the most important thing about a common carrier is that they're a monopoly. If they're not a monopoly, they they're not a common carrier, right? And because they, they're because they're they're alternatives, you don't have to choose that one, right? And Twitter is definitely not a monopoly, not even close to a monopoly. There are many different like you just you 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 made this point well just now without without explicitly saying it. There are many different social media devices. They come and they go. The apps come and go. You don't even need social media to say things. You can say things all kinds of ways. And so it's it. There's a lot of competition in the marketplace, especially in so there are heaps of social media engines. So it's uh yeah, it's not even close to a monopoly. So I don't think there's any argument to be made that's a common carrier. Um, so yeah, so I, I think from a free speech point of view, it's pretty cut and dry to be honest. And to be honest, I'm surprised they pass these laws in the first place. Like you said, they're not very serious laws. Yeah. Yeah. Not, it's yeah, uh, like they're, 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 they're laws from people who were intending to run for president. Like Abbott didn't end up running, but at the, by the time he passed the law, it seemed like that he might run. <laughs> that's it. That, yeah. that, and just yeah. to be clear, just in case people are thinking this, you know, so what if you're in the business of selling Confederate flags, right? Confederate mm. flags are the flags of the South, and they're considered to be racist symbols in America. But yeah. you should totally have a right to sell Confederate flags. You have a right to fly Confederate flags, even mm. if you're, you know. You want to show people you're an idiot, that's great. But then they say, well, wait a minute, I was trying to sell them on Facebook and Facebook was stopping people from uh, um, sharing it. Yeah. Like, I think that's kind of interesting, okay? Yeah. But even then, Facebook could say, we don't want Confederate flags on our platform. Mm. Thank you very much. You're welcome to come on the platform and show your kids photos and stuff like this, but we're not going to support a business. And they say, hey, well, it's a free country. You're not allowed to do that. It's like, it's our platform. Go sell them somewhere else. There's mm-hmm. all these different ways. And it is a little harsh. You know, you can say, well, Facebook is so big, it doesn't really seem fair, right? But then the next argument is, go start your own social media site. Like, go to the one where the social media site that lets you sell confederate flags if there's actual a market it'll fill it'll form a market right yeah and, and that's and, what i mean and this is what we've seen right we, we've seen right-wing social media engines pop up right and yeah. they're not run very well and no. stuff like this but then but they you exist know, and look at twitter right now twitter mm. has been bought mm. by someone else mm. and is completely a changed mm. institution yeah yeah um and also by the way leaving aside the free speech issues which is all i think you need to care about but leaving that aside it's completely impractical as well. Like, like, like I said oh, before, yeah. Yeah, like since exactly. 2015, there have been 1.7 million banned accounts just for promoting terrorism and illegal activities alone. Think of how many tens of millions of moderation decisions there are. Do you want them all to go to court? My God, it'd just it'd be insane, right? Uh, I should also point out one more thing about this, which is the incredible hypocrisy of DeSantis, of all people, having one of these laws. Like to try and force um, a, a, a a social media to not ban conservatives. That's essentially what this law is about, yeah. right? When he has turned around and just banned the social justice for Palestine groups from his universities, yeah. right? Universities is where you should have free speech more than anywhere, right? And like, and he's he's acting like they're assisting terrorism, which is bullshit. But like, essentially, he's cr- he's cl- clamping down on the ro- on the free speech rights of the students in his universities at exactly the same time as he's in court trying to stop 
Twitter from clamping down on the free speech rights of them. The uh, when like it just it's just so hypocritical. Yeah. It's so it's very very cynical. Yeah. And like I said, there's an I think it's very 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 complicated on so many levels. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to act like it isn't, but there really could be this way of getting toward it. And I think it's a transparency issue where you say, look at, these are the algorithms we do. Here's how to opt out. Here's how to get your mom and dad opting out if they're getting older. Here's how to opt out your kids. And they should also promote more of this blocking and stuff, which Mm. they don't because, um, um, there's all sorts of scuzzy stuff that goes on. That's the other thing. There's mm-hmm. like, I don't know about you. I don't know if you're on Facebook much, but Facebook is just completely filled with people friending you who yeah. just have one or two photos. Mm-hmm. And if you're a guy, they're kind of women, not very highly dressed. Maybe everyone wants to be your friend there. <laughs> <laughs> and that there's just a lot of them. Yeah. And of course, you know, and the thing is, I, go, I so I go, okay, well, I'm going to try to block this and report it. And it's incredibly tedious. It is. You click and you yeah. click and it's, it's really not clear annoying. and it yeah. says... You know, like it gives you a bunch of choices and none of them are, this is an obviously fake account by yeah. a woman with fake boobs, you know, yeah. where, no, no <laughs> illustrated by a woman with, yeah. fake, you know, it's yeah, not, yeah. that's obviously not yeah. her. Yeah. And they make that very difficult. And then they kind of pepper you with all these things. And you think of all these older guys and older women and stuff like that being victimized. And there's nothing about that. Mm-hmm. You know, Facebook could easily say, hey, we have an epidemic of this going on. Be aware of this. We're trying to crack down. Help us. They never do stuff like that. There's mm-hmm. all these things that you can hold them to. And um, and particularly with um, older people, because I, you know, when I was back home in Arizona, I was dealing with my mom and a bunch of other older people. And it's really hard to protect those people online. It really honestly is. And um, if you ever gone into like an older person's Facebook account, it's really crazy. I mean, they have all these people they don't really know and all this crazy stuff coming at them. It's really, we kind of forget that, you know, quote unquote, sophisticated user on Facebook, we kind of understand it and how to manipulate it. And a lot of people don't. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll say on that particular thing is just that um, the thing I said about DeSantis before, I just, as I was saying, I was thinking, oh, I should say this. It's the converse argument works as well, applies as well, which is, if you're, say, at uni and you are uh, into microaggressions, when I say you're, you're, you're into being upset about microaggressions and creating safe spaces for particular minority groups, you can't then turn around and go, it's okay to scare the shit out of Jewish people, though. Right? Like, you know, like just like, like you need to be consistent one way or another, right? Now, I'm personally would prefer you be consistent on the free speech a- 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 angle. So, if you want to be scaring the shit out of Jewish people, fine, but then you better take it when we're to- when other people are talking about black people or transgender people or women or whatever. Like just like you, you you can't you can't have double standards on right. on what is free speech and what's not in free speech. Right. I agree. It's just yeah, like whatever whatever your whatever your line that you're drawing is. And you know? this goes back yeah. in my life, you know. I, yeah. And I I worked at the student newspaper at Berkeley mm. back in the day, and and you know when um. Reagan was in office. Jean Kirkpatrick mm. was his awful national security advisor. Mm. She came to speak at campus. Now everyone wanted to shut her down. Mm. Okay. And we dutifully ran a little editorial saying, mm. look at, yes, she's an idiot. Hold a mm. sign up saying you're an idiot, but this is the home of free speech and you mm. don't shut people down even mm. if they're, um, and this was a big problem during the Trump. I actually wrote a story for the Columbia Journalism Review during the first Trump campaign because mm. there are all these people protesting and disrupting Trump rallies. And I forget if I mentioned this before, but he spoke in Arizona once in this certain place where there's only one road to it. Mm. And protesters like shut the road down and glued themselves to the ground and stuff like that to stop people from going to this Trump rally. And the thing is my parents, if they've still been alive, they might've been going out to see the Trump rally, you know, yeah. and they have a right to go see Trump without like these snotty kids disrupting their day. Mm. Like it's an election. Mm. <laughs> work for the other person make yeah. phone calls you yeah. know get yeah. people to vote yeah, yeah. if people had done that instead of protesting maybe he wouldn't have won you mm. know what i mean so mm. there's you just should not be disrupting and particularly in elections you mm. you that's what elections are for you campaign for the other person you don't disrupt and stop people from speaking but, yeah, so I, my point being i'm consistent like i literally yes. wrote a story saying mm. trump was right yeah. the protesters they were victimizing his, yeah. trump's idiot supporters yeah. in a way they did not deserve to be disrupted yeah fair enough okay now given the time i want okay. I, I know you want to talk about uh the the corporate trial in new york with trump oh yeah i'm yeah, trying what to think um that? just the uh sorry what happened to my little computer the um the one thing that i think doesn't quite get 
understood enough is that uh, this is a show trial, yeah. right? And so all these antics that are going on mm. are completely pointless and mm. meaningless because this isn't a jury trial, right? Mm. This is what they call a bench trial. There's a yeah. judge there. Um, it's it's overstated sometimes that he's already decided, but he didn't. He took like just one part of this, like had fraud been yeah. committed? And he said, yes, it had been. Yeah. But then there's several other things and they're establishing damages, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so- all this stuff that's going on with Trump on the stand and Don Jr. on the stand and all these other people saying whatever they are, um, people keep getting more and upset about it, about how Don Jr. was running all over the judge and Trump obviously is being an idiot and stuff like that. But it just doesn't matter because the judge is just sitting there waiting very patiently. <laughs> there's not going to be a juror. There's not going to be a holdout. There's not going to be a mistrial. Yeah. The judge is going to say, this is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's well established to do this. And I think he's just calculating all this stuff up in his mind. And um, so I think that's going to be um, pretty interesting. And then I think the judge has um, handled himself pretty well. And But they're very good. The Trump people are very good at digging in on his little, his, I shouldn't say his little assistant, his clerk who's with him. Have you, I'm sure you've been reading about this. I have. He has this clerk who's a woman who sits next to him and talks to him. They go, oh, you know, making all these sort of insinuations about it. And again, that's not something that higher judges are going to talk well to in appeal. So I think that's going to be a fun decision when it comes down. Are you across the complaint against his assistant? Oh, that, that she was had her picture taken once with- No, 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 no. It's from that guy, but it's a different complaint. No, no there's a legal complaint against her. Uh-huh, what they, is that? Uh, let, me, let me tell you about this. This is quite new. So this is some, some news. The guy who took the picture, like uh, what, what, what Bill's referring to there was, we did talk about this on Pepper a bit, right. that there was some- Twitter account called Judicial Protest that put out a photo of Alison Greenfield, that's her name, the clerk, uh, right. with taking a posing for a photo with Chuck Schumer and then Trump tweeted it out or truthed it out saying, basically implying they were having an affair <laughs> and, the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the judge went crazy and that was when he, had, he put the gag order down. Um, the guy who sent out that photo in the first place, Judicial Protest, turns out he's a bit of a, he's obviously a Trump fanboy, but he's also a lawyer. His, uh -huh. na his name is Brock Fredden, uh -huh. and he has sent an official complaint uh, and put it on public. If you want to read it, it's online. You can read it. It's 72 pages long if you're interested. Uh, the, uh, anyway, he, uh, he's, clearly, he's clearly been looking for anything he can get on, on the judge or his clerk or whatever to help Trump, and he's, he's found something. Oh, really? What was it? New York ethics rules don't allow court officials to donate more than $500 a year to, quote, all political campaigns for political office and other partisan political activity. He's been going through Greenfield's donations, the clerk. Yeah. And in 2022 alone, she gave $3,335 in political donations to Democrat candidates and causes in New York, which is more than six times the maximum allowed annually for court Excellent. officials. <laughs> He's also found this year she's given a th over $1,000 already to Democrat candidates and causes. That's twice as much. Now, obviously, this is not a big deal, right? Like right. the, uh, but. Like it's not like that would get the case thrown out. She's she's not even the judge. She's a clerk, right? The um, and it's just and it's it's not not about bias. It's not about it's not suggesting that she's been administering her role unprofessionally. She just bre she just breached an ethical rule, generally speaking, right? Yeah. With donations, right? What it will do though is allow Trump to shriek like a banshee about this for the next ten years. Yeah. <laughs> he'll never he'll yeah. never let this go, right? Yeah. Um. Uh, and I've got to say, on one hand, I have to hand it to his fanboys. They do keep digging up genuine examples over and over again of unethical behavior from Trump's opponents. But I just want to just highlight that this is a really interesting thing about Trump, that it's usually quite minor stuff, the stuff that they dig up, but it seems bigger because Trump doesn't stop bitching about it. He just yeah, goes on yeah, and on and on and on, right? He's very good at that, at, at cram megaphone. And it's interesting because... He himself is the most imperfect person we've ever seen in politics, right? The, and probably will ever see in politics. He's so full of flaws, right? He, he's like he's just filled with flaws, and yet he he punishes you for your flaws when you're not perfect. When responding to him in such a massive way, oh, yeah. there's a real double standard. It, like it's kind of his secret. He expects a much higher standard from everyone else than everyone else expects from him. Yeah, he, and he acts indignant about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and he's very, very good at doing that. And again, this it's, is in the, right, yeah. we're talking about 
issues of hundreds of dollars. Yes. Right? Yes. In New yeah. York politics. Yes. And this is New York, which is one of yeah. the most expensive yeah. cities in the world. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that was probably yeah. a law that was passed 50 years ago or yeah. something like that. Yeah. And of course, you know, everyone, you know, it's, it's a political thing, all the judges and stuff like this. While he is in the midst of a fraud trial, right, which literally could be fines in the nine figures. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, that's right. Hundreds. And he's talking about two, what, what, three figures yeah, versus what, nine, six orders of magnitude. Yeah, it's yeah, a great point. Like he's talking about a couple of thousand dollars when he is he is on the hook for having enriched himself by a quarter of a billion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> that is that is that is a great point. Um, but the, it goes in further. They've been quite clever about this. Like it's so oh, it's so Machiavellian. Um, they haven't applied for a mistrial. Which is, yeah, you know, if you genuinely thought you were being wronged, yeah, and you genuinely thought that she was so biased, as like you, you apply for a mistrial, right? Yeah. They haven't applied for a mistrial. And the reason for that is because that can then that motion could be dismissed, and then that's the end of it. Yeah. Right? No. What they've done is Elise Ste- Stefanik has coincidentally made a complaint about this to the New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct. Now, the reason why this is so clever is because A, it won't do anything. Right, so just keep on, just, just keeping on, which is fine. They don't care. They don't want anything to happen. Yeah. They just want it to be there so they can bitch about it, right? Because they're because they're going to the court of public opinion here, right? Um, the complaints just going. The commission only meets a few times a year, so it'll sit there for at least three or four oh, months. Interesting. Yeah, and it won't be heard. Even if they dismiss it immediately, it'll still take three or four months for them to hear it, right? Yeah. So it's just going to sit there forever, right? Um, which will give them a license to whine and whine and whine about this complaint because it hasn't been dismissed yet, right? Um, and even though it reads like it was written by a lawyer, this complaint, like it was clearly written by a lawyer, and at least Stefanik is not a lawyer, yeah. uh, Congress people aren't subject, sub- subjected to federal FOIA requests. So there's no way anyone can prove that Trump's lawyers did actually write that complaint. Oh, right, but right, Stefanik, yeah, yeah. it was just, just her, she just happens to have this complaint. So- so it's really cleverly done to maximize the whining and minimize the chance that there could be any resolution because they know the resolution won't be in their favor. Yeah. Right? So it's so anyway, so this complaint's gonna go on and on and on. You can expect to hear about this Greenfield is biased thing forever. Forever, yeah. So anyway, so that, that there's that as I well. I have a feeling though <laughs> it's gonna get lost in the in the um in everything else. But yeah, that's that's a great that's a great story. <laughs> so there you go. Um, on this note, actually, just, just quickly, when you're talking about the, the media circus that this is, yeah. in Chutkin's trial, in the Washington trial, this is the January 6th trial, Trump's lawyers have applied for the January 6th trial to be televised. Oh, right. right now, right, right, right. now yeah. federal trials aren't supposed to be televised. Yes, they're not right? going to be televised, yeah. But the judge can allow it. If the judge wants, really? Yes, the judge is allowed. The, the judge, the judge has the power to allow it, even though they're not supposed to be. Right? Oh, I thought it was a violation. No, okay. no, no. The judge, the judge can rule for it to be televised. Right. Now, Trump's filing, I'll just read the, the quote from their filing. For the first time in American history, an incumbent administration has charged its main leading electoral opponent with a criminal <laughs> offense. Aware that its charges are meritless, the prosecution sought to proceed in secret, forcing the nation and the world to rely on biased secondhand accounts coming from the Biden administration and its media allies. As a result, the citizens of our great country are unable to review for themselves what the facts of this case show and how unfairly President Trump is being treated at the hands of his political opponent. Okay, so that's what they have to say. <laughs> My question to you, Bill Wyman, is what do you think? Do you think if, if they can be televised, do you think it should be televised or not? Well, I've seen this discussed a lot, and I thought the whole point is that there's just these federal rules. I didn't I didn't understand that the judge could do it. I, ju- think that I believe all- that like, – I might be wrong, but I believe yeah. the judge can do it if they want to. But that, that – I mean, the rule says they're not to be televised, but the judge has the ability to overrule uh-huh. that. Yeah, then then this is something I'm not qualified to talk about because my understanding was just that that's the whole the whole reason that it's a no go. Mm-hmm. But then there was this other thing going on about it where uh, didn't it that the Jack Smith people had talked to Trump and said, "Hey, do you want this televised?" And they said, "Nope, we don't want it." And so Jack Smith said, "Okay, we don't want it televised." And Trump said, "Oh, we want it televised." Oh, I, d- I didn't know about that. Yeah, that, that might they, be the case. Did, and so I think yeah. Smith right now is saying, "Hey." 
you know, it's a, it's a thing with, you know, you get, like dealing with him, it's like with a three-year-old boy, you know, playing like <laughs> to his two parents and his aunt and uncle and his grandmother and the babysitter yeah. and the nice lady next door all yeah. against each other and just mm-hmm. running from one and just causing, and everyone is just getting um, fed up with them. But I think that the last thing I read was that Jack Smith had to file something that said, look, for the record, we asked those bozos. They said no. We said this. Now they're saying this. And what I kind of wonder is that at some point in one of these trials, I just have a sense like the judge is just going to... The trouble with Trump is that and in every interview, every debate, every trial now, they get, he gets to start at zero. Mm. You know what I mean? And I, and I just wonder one of these times the judge is going to just the first day... Just say, go to the stand and put on the stand and say, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't, you know, just say these 10 things that Mm. you can't do. And because otherwise, you know, he's just going to ramp it up, ramp it up. And I Mm. wonder, and we've seen the courts adjust to it, actually. You know, we've seen increasingly the appeal during the uh, post-2020 election, the the appeals courts just saying, yep, we'll take this. Nope, throw it away. Mm. Yep, we'll take this. You know, things have been moving very fast. Mm. So I think another thing we're going to see next year is this increased lack of tolerance. Things are going to get appealed. They're going to say, yep, we'll do it on Monday. Here's your decision on Tuesday. Get back to work. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah. So, 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 but you don't have a view about, about whether... Well, no, I mean, that it, it, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, trials should be televised, okay, mm. period. But, of course, there's reasons why not. Obviously, he's going to take advantage to it, mm. stuff like this. Um, if you want to be political, I don't think we should be political about it, but obviously going to be very demonizing of him mm. to see all this stuff come out on the stand. Um, we didn't get to the Jenna Ellis, but there's just such devastating... Oh, um, you, you can if you, you want. to do that before we go? I, you can, we can. Um, yeah, there's we'll, such we'll devastating this information... Yeah. That's going to be out. Yeah. Um, I'm old enough to remember the Watergate trials and mm. stuff like this. I mean, this stuff comes out and it's just, you know, it it, it marks a generation. Mm. So um, I think it'll be really bad for him. Um, the judiciary in America, you know, obviously there's problems at the Supreme Court and, you know, it's been very politicized, but, you know, it basically does its job. And mm. the whole thing that people should understand, and maybe people in Australia don't quite get this, but all this stuff he's doing, you know, it's for the popular thing. It's to raise money. It's just the uh, the um, it's just for all these outside forces. He's not really litigating these cases in a realistic way. But it's a very, you know, the American justice system is very unforgiving. Mm. It's just this yeah. machine, you know, and and um, and I, you know, I have a lot of friends who are lawyers and who do all sorts of crazy stuff, and you know, it's heartbreaking to what it does to a lot of people. I mean, you know, obviously 90% of the people deserve it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I shouldn't say deserve it, but, you know, there's a reason they're there. Mm-hmm. Um, probably 97%, right? But there's a small percentage that get ground up in it. But you do get ground up in it, and he's he's in the, the gears. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I think is really forgotten, um, and I was thinking this is kind of, it's not a quite unified theory, but people should know, is that he's a tactical person. He's the most supremely tactical person. And so what he's going to do, he's got himself into this. He's going to lose all these cases. What is he going to do? Okay, I'm just going to go shout and shout and shout. I'm just going to throw bombs over here. I'm going to take mm. my shirt off. I'm going to sue someone else. I'm going to fly to Russia. I'm mm. going to start a new TV, you know, mm. and whatever fix he gets into, he doesn't, he doesn't have any plan for beyond step A, you mm. know, he's not, he doesn't, he's not, he doesn't have an end and goal. He's, he's, he's supremely reactive. And so everything he's doing is tactical and reactive. And that's why we get into this stuff. And again, it's like a three-year-old, you know, you say mm. you're babysitting, actually a 10-year-old, you're babysitting the 10-year-old next door. You say, stay here. He gets in the mud. Mm. You say, stay there. I'm going to rinse you off the hose. He runs in, you say, get off the couch and he gets on the couch and you finally get him in the bathtub. And then he throws food around. And then by the time the parents gets home, you're about to kill him. And he goes, the parents, he goes, he touched me. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's like what he is. He just, you just can't stop him. And so I, I think at a certain point there, people are just going to set him down figuratively and tie ropes around him and make him deal with some of this stuff. But I could be wrong. In his case, he does, actually does throw food, uh, yeah. apparently. Um, okay, all, all I'd say about that, the the televising question is that, like, yes, I've kind of got a devil on my shoulder and a and an angel on my shoulder. The devil on my shoulder is, the, like you said, we shouldn't be political, but is the, is the political side, which is that would not... It would not be good for Trump for him to get what he wants. Like, for, if Trump, if if Trump during this trial is just yeah you know, playing to the cameras, acting like an asshole the whole time, that would be terrible for him. Like, like I like I've said many times on this podcast, the more you see of Trump, the worse he polls. Yeah. That would be very. He thinks he 
thinks he wins people over by doing that, but he doesn't. Yeah. They, they get sick of him. And so it would actually be terrible for him and for his political campaign if it was televised, in my view. But having said that, the angel on my shoulder is the legal ethicist. And leaving aside the fact that he shouldn't get special treatment, which is what he's asking for, and there's a, the, leaving that aside is a very, very good reason why it shouldn't be televised. And it's not that he's going to turn to a circus, even though that is a good reason as well, um, and that he'll just spend the whole time uh, speechifying and just trying to appeal to the people at home rather than worrying about his court case. Um, that's not the main reason. The main reason is because if it's televised, there will be a whole bunch of lives ruined. Every single witness, their lives will be ruined. Oh, good point, yeah. Every single yeah. other person who turns up is yeah. going to get our mate judicial protest yeah. Yeah. Going, through their, going through their life and like every single person who's there should be as anonymous as they possibly can be yeah. because they will be destroyed. Yeah. If they're saying anything negative about Trump, they will be destroyed. His people will make sure of it. And so, and so, and if if it's televised, he will be destroying them live on TV. Yeah. Like, like there's, and it's it's just yeah. So, I think I think in Trump's trials, every single possible step should be taken to protect the innocent, who are the people who are not on. Behind, who are yeah. not in the dock, <laughs> and uh, the uh, and so yeah, for that reason, they just can't be televised. Yeah. I would and say. and people should remember another thing that I think comes to mind in America of people of a certain age is that we did go through this before with Nixon. Okay, mm. and Nixon, of course, famously was pardoned by Gerald Ford, right, mm. which he shouldn't have done. But the Attorney General of the United States, the domestic policy advisor, the foreign policy advisor, mm. there were his three major people all went literally went to prison: mm. Haldeman, Ehrlichman, mm. Mitchell. And then I forget how many other underling thugs mm -hmm. went to prison as well. Yeah, yeah. So this isn't quite, I mean, this actually has kind of happened before. Mm -hmm. And Nixon kind of got off scot-free um, in a way that was kind of unfortunate, probably, because he really did. I mean, it's just like Trump that, you know, that what Nixon did was so much worse than what we know at the time, mm -hmm. right? And of course, what Trump's done is so mm -hmm. much worse than we know, mm -hmm. right? Um, and maybe this is a good time just to bring up the Ellis thing. This Can is I see that. I, I, that would, this yes. was just a breaking thing I, I, today. Like you, I know you've got to go soon, so so, so yeah. well, let's finish with this. You tell us about. Okay, this. so yeah. all it is is that you know all this dribs and drabs, you know. Mm. And the thing is, Jack Smith knows so much more than we do, right? Mm. The, a lot of there have been so many interviews and stuff mm. done behind the scenes in these grand juries, which are secretive. Um, oh, can I say one other thing? Actually? Yeah, Before say, say the one other thing. People you're the limit. Understand about say whatever you want. Um, <laughs> these court things that is unfortunate <laughs> is that I wish. That in the coverage and even the judges, you know, when they start, they should say, people should understand how the system works, okay? Mm -hmm. There's a grand jury. Those are random citizens. They're brought in and the prosecutor comes in and says, hey, we think this person committed a crime. Mm -hmm. We're going to lay it out to you, okay? It's not the pr prosecutor's decision, right? It's mm -hmm. actually independent people and they actually are a vetting of this, okay? Mm -hmm. And they don't say you did the crime. Mm -hmm. They say there's probable cause, yeah. okay? And of course, they always say in America, you know, a prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich, mm -hmm. right? But still, that's what happened. I mean, there were, and actually grand juries are very large. I think 19 or 29 sometimes, stuff like this. I don't know how they work. But in all these different jurisdictions, this mm -hmm. isn't just Biden or a random prosecutor throwing someone on trial. I mean, there's this huge system with all these breaks and people saying, look, we're going to get screwed if we do this and all this internal debate to do this. And I wish they were just, they would put these things in context. And my train of thought was that if things do get publicized, it'd be great if the judge would start things out and can't, you know, just to remind people that this is the process that brought us to this. There's actually two levels of these juries that have to sign off. Uh, and by the way, just to, just to pick up on what you're saying while you prepare for the generalist thing, um, the, the, off that, I hate, I hate so much the way people act like Biden is the one who's, who's, Indicting him, oh yes, yeah, like ridiculous. because because I mean, leaving aside the fact that theoretically they're independent, leaving that aside, they're clearly independent because if Biden has his way, had his way, Trump would have been charged years ago. Do you think Biden wants all this shit in the middle of an election oh, yeah. year? Yeah, the January six case, absolutely, Biden would have wanted. If Biden was the puppet master. He would have been charged in 2021. Trump keeps on saying, "Oh, why did they take two or three years to charge me?" As if, as if that is a positive to them for him to be charged now. Yeah. 
the best thing for them would have been for him to be get out of the way well before the primaries when there's less partisanship around. Just get him out of the picture. Yeah. Just just get the end of Trump. See the back of him. Yeah. That's the best thing for Biden, not to let hang around and hang over the election campaign so then there's a big asterisk over the result of the election. That's not in Biden's interest. Right. No one likes that. And they play the media mm. too because ideally when they are on these ridiculous shows and mm. spouting that off, the person mm. should say, actually, for the record, that's not what happened. Yeah. They should just grind people down. They say, every time you say that, I'm going to go into a 45 second description of the grand jury process in America. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? They, yeah. they really need to kind yeah. of grind people yeah. down and just keep, and what happened is they roll their eyes. It's just thing. But mm. then there is that impression. But mm. if every time someone said that, mm. you know, Chuck Todd or whoever said, um, just a reminder, let's remind people of how the grand jury system works mm. and that there is this level before it even gets there. And then there's this. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so yeah. um, anyway, there's one of the sad people around Trump is Jenna Ellis. Yep. As I think I've said before, what people should also understand about American politics is that Trump had the B team the first day he took office around mm. him. Okay. And it was the lowest of the B team. I mean, we we're mm. talking Corey Lewandowski, mm. Steve Bannon. You know, there were a couple of quasi major figures like Rex Tillerson and stuff like this, but basically everyone who worked for him was second tier, okay? Yeah. Low second tier, yeah. okay? And of course, over the course of it, it got worse and worse and worse. So at the end of it, we're with the Z team. These are the saddest, <laughs> most broken people in Washington, right? Yeah, and sure. so we look at people like Cassie Hutchinson or yeah. stuff like this, and you go, oh, she's so noble. It's like, she was there for three years, yeah. <laughs> 11 months, yeah. and 29 days. Yeah. And at the end, she's like, oh, yeah, maybe this isn't good. Mm -hmm. So um, just remember, these are not substantive people, okay? Yeah. So anyway, one of these bozos is Jenna Ellis, mm. and I think I've heard this, that she's oh, distinguished for Sorry, being sorry, just jumping. I was like, with Cassie, I know you're just giving me an example. With Cassie Hutchinson, we actually backs up what you're saying. She wasn't there the whole time. She came a bit later, but she came straight out of college. Yeah, but like, she'd work like for, with, did she work for Scalise or she worked for some bozo yeah, Republican? Yeah, 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 just, yeah, she did. You know. but, but my point is, my point is she, she wasn't the best of the best. She came basically straight out of college. Yeah. And it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a great college and she got m amazing marks. She was just a rando who ended up being in a position of power, basically. Right, just sitting down the hall because yeah, she's this because, passive. Because, yeah. because I was and taking I'm not being it, sexist and he, or anything, but, but I mean, the stuff that went yeah, on, yeah. like she knew she knew what was going on. Mm. Like she'd seen all the COVID stuff, the irresponsibility. Yeah. Like, I'm just backing up your Z team thing. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah anyway, so go so on. Anyway, just, yeah. just to be clear, when we talk yeah. about Jenna Ellis. Yeah. She's the only thing you can say for her is that when all of his bozo, you know, Star Wars cantina lawyer meetings get before the, the microphone, she's the only one who looked normal. Yeah. You know, she wasn't Sidney Powell. No. She wasn't really, she was just like a normal person. Yeah. So anyway, she's the latest person to have now tearfully turned on Trump and she's she gonna, she's cut a deal and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. But anyway, ABC News in America, the ABC, American ABC just got these leaked videos of some of her leaked testimony, of some of her testimony to, I guess- um, This will be the Georgia trial, I guess. Yes. Yeah. From the Georgia prosecutor. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, and all this is, there's a guy in the White House named Dan Scavino, yeah. and that she has this testimony that shows you what I just said about how things actually were worse than we thought, mm. right? Okay. So we had this thing that at a certain point they said, oh, we're going to be wild and all this kind of evolving stuff. Mm. Okay. So this is her talking about, I think this is on December 17th or something like this. Okay. Yeah. So there's a video here of her sitting in a chair testifying. Uh, at the time... Uh, period where they were going to start to discuss what was uh, Dan Scavino's role? At the time, I believe his title was social media director for the White House. It became deputy chief of staff um, at the time that the conversation in question took place. Okay, and when was that? The conversation was around December 19th of 2020 uh, at the White House Christmas party. And I uh, emphasized him, I thought that the, um, the, the claims and the ability to challenge uh, the election results was essentially over because he said um, to me in a kind of excited tone, well, we don't care and we're not going to leave. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, the boss, meaning President Trump, and everyone understood the boss. Um, that's what we all called him. Um, he said the boss uh, is not going to leave under any circumstances. We are just going to stay in power. And I said to him, well, it doesn't quite work that way, you realize. And he said, we don't care.
So as you can see from that, mm. I mean, there's going to be extraordinarily damning testimony. Yes. Again, I'm not a lawyer, but the commentary on this on Twitter is that it's not hearsay because mm. it has to do with the intent of the person involved. So it's something that's going to be admissible. And you can see um, there was another, someone else chimed in on Twitter, another one of the people who's turned on Trump saying, yes, I heard the same thing and I testified the same. So there's going to be people at these trials saying extraordinarily damning things. So the... Um, and that's going to be in Georgia, so mm. it is going to be televised. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And and people should look it up. This again, this was the tape of Jenna, um, Jenna Ellis. You can look it up on Twitter or wherever. And um, there's also one that is just too dismal to sh play of Sidney Powell. Yeah. <laughs> and poor Sidney Powell. I don't know. I almost feel sorry for her at this point. I mean, this is <laughs> one sad, bedraggled. Uh, <laughs> soon to be disbarred lawyer yeah. <laughs> and uh she was just talking about how rudy giuliani was so mean to her and ber mm. berating her and um in some of these ridiculous meetings and then her going into this crazy thing again like trump supposedly wanted to make her a special prosecutor or special like, counsel yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like why mm. like i mean it's just so funny the thing about trump sometimes is like he can hire anyone he wants hi, like hi bring her on board mm. make her a lawyer what you know, and like, oh, can I make her a special? Like, getting into these ridiculous discussions about you can just hire her. Like, yeah, yeah, what's yeah. the? I, yeah. She supposedly already was his lawyer, but then mm. she she wasn't. But then she mm. was, and then mm. like, it's just so ridiculous. You know, this bumbling, Mister Magoo type kind of antics that go on. So I think all that's going to be um, pretty juicy in the Georgia trial, actually. If it ever gets to trial. Yes, that is an if. Um, the, uh, and just on the Magoo thing with, with, with courts, I might as well just throw this in here, uh, which is uh, the Florida trial. Uh, they, there was some Magoo lawyering going on there. They, uh, Trump's team tried to pull a Swifty where they were, they were seeking to have the court case in Florida delayed past the election right? because of how – of how many deadlines they had to meet in these other trials. They said it's just not fair, right? Yeah. And and Aileen Cannon, the uh, the the judge who is quite sympathetic towards Trump, she heard that she heard their motion and she she said that she was likely to delay the trial. Mm -hmm. And while she was going away, before she actually passed her mo uh, passed her ruling, they immediately then just took that and just ran straight to the DC trial <laughs> and said, "Oh, we think we need to put that off." As well, yeah. because of because so many deadlines, and also because we're we're applying for immu for immunity, and uh, like we'd like to put this off while we have our immunity uh, challenge uh, heard, and like it just so basically they they didn't tell Aileen Cannon they were they were trying to get the the Washington trial put off, right? But they used the Washington trial to try and get the Florida trial put off, right? So so then the, both of them would be pushed past the election, right? And um. And, but they, they didn't wait till she ruled before they did that. So then Jack Smith just immediately went back to Florida and said, hey, yeah, 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 have a look what they're doing in Washington. Yeah. <laughs> like it's a uh, um, quote, defendant Trump's actions in the hours following the hearing in this case illustrate the point and confirm his overriding interest in delaying both trials at any cost. This court shouldn't allow itself to be manipulated in this fashion, <laughs> said yeah. Jack Smith. Yeah. And, um, and that put Cannon in an awkward position because she's already been overruled once by the 11th Circuit for getting sucked in by, by Trump's lawyers. And she changed her mind. So now there's no delay in the Florida right. case. Yeah. So uh, they're going to re revisit the question on, on the 1st of March 2024. But they got a little bit too clever <laughs> for their yeah, for, for good then. So anyway, so that, that's enough for that. Let me see if there was one, any other, I think that's all. If there's anything I, else you want to talk about, you can talk about um, it. I'm going to. I haven't. I haven't gotten to Biden, Missouri, which was the other social no, media yeah. case. Dave, I'm sorry, Dave. We are yeah, going to yeah, talk yeah, about Biden, yeah. Missouri, in two days' time, mate, or three days' time. Yeah, there's some other media stuff, but let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Okay, all right, that's fine. This has been incredibly interesting. Thank it you. has been good. Thank you so much, Bill. As always, it's that's always a blast. It's a good challenge. It forces me to think about stuff. <laughs> well. I'm glad at least we're making you think about stuff. Hopefully we're, we're making our audience think about stuff as well, but I'll take what I can get. Thanks, guys. We'll see you on Friday. Thanks Stay peppy. Bye-bye.